San Carlos City Council meeting for October 10th, 2016. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Do we have any changes to the order of the agenda? No changes from staff this evening, Mr. Mayor. How about from any of my colleagues? Okay. Mr. Rubens, do we have a report from closed session? There's no report from closed session tonight. All right, then we'll move on to item five, council communications and announcements, and we'll start with Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Crystal, if you could put that up. We'll see if I remembered how to use the remote control from last time. I wanted to give uh, my colleagues an update on the uh, petition that's out in the field that I put out there uh, urging the council to uh, revisit the issue of sidewalk repairs and to share the cost between uh, property owners in the city. Um, as of... Hmm. There we go. Oops. Go there we go. Thank you. Um, uh, as of uh, this afternoon, there were 248 signatures from San Carlos residents, um, as is the case with most, most change.org polls, since they don't filter them by uh, locale. People from various other parts of the world can, can weigh in. Uh, there are seven people from outside San Carlos, but 248 signatures I think is a pretty significant number. Um, what's also, I think, even more interesting is that uh, there's quite a bit of concern when you read the comments uh, about the existing policy and the desire to see it changed. I actually have a printout of all of the uh, names and the comments, which I'll circulate in a moment and ask Crystal to keep in the minutes for the meeting. But I just wanted to give you a few highlights of uh, some of the things. So probably about 100 comments, 100 people individually commented. Um, and they range all over the place. Um, they range from folks that just flat out, as you can see in the center here, just think the current policy is wrong, um, and uh, uh, people who are concerned about the cost of it, um, and uh, accepting the argument that since it's a shared resource that there ought to be a sharing of the cost as well. Um, but it's not all uh, purely negative. I mean, everybody is supportive of the idea of making the change that was being proposed. Um, but there are a number of people who also indicated that uh, they believe it's the right thing to share the costs, as you see here with that one highlighted item in the middle. It's fair to share. There were a number of people who echoed a similar sen sentiment. We also have a situation, if you look in the lower right-hand corner, a number of people were talking about how uh, because they're on fixed incomes and they've had to deal with this issue several times already, it's becoming a, quite a bit of a burden to them and they don't like asking for help, but they are asking for help. So um, uh, I once again bring up the idea that uh, we ought to take this matter up for action. I know that uh, we're Suppose we're going to be uh, potentially talking about it at our strategic planning discussion in November. Uh, but frankly, I think the issue is straightforward enough. The cost is minimal enough that we ought to just go ahead and put it on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. All right, uh, Ron. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't have a lot to report. Uh, sure. I was uh, out of the country for a week fighting Ma uh, Hurricane Matthew. But uh, it did finally go away, and we had some fun. Um, I did want to uh, say that I got back just in time for the Art and Wine Fair and uh, spent about uh, three hours yesterday at, at the uh, uh, token booth selling uh, wine and beer tokens. And it was a, a great Art and Wine Fair. I think the Chamber did, a, once again, a fabulous job and uh, really enjoyed it. And that's all I have. Thank you, Ron. Matt? I really have nothing to report. I did go to the Art and Wine Fair as well. Saw Ron in one of the booths, but uh, was just walking around with my wife and enjoying it. So that's it. Thanks, Matt. Bob? Gee, I went to the Art and Wine Fair too, gosh. But um, Forgot to mention that I saw you in passing. That's right, thank you. Then I wouldn't have had to say it. But uh, um, I went to a... Ron wasn't able to go because he was down with Hurricane Matthew, but... Um, um, we had a Four Corners meeting. Four Corners is City of Belmont, City of San Carlos, representatives from each, represented from the Sequoia High School District and representatives from the uh, San Carlos uh, Elementary School District um, who are in, we have a plan to try to um, alleviate traffic over uh, by Carlmont High School and Tierra Linda School. And we have a, a tentative plan uh, that we've gone for, uh, I think Jay, we've gone for some, applied for some grants and things. 
and we had a, a meeting with a lot of folks that came, I think a lot of them are from Belmont, who wanted some more information about uh, how uh, it was going to work and how the plan was going to go, and it was a very good meeting. I think it was about an hour and a half, and I think uh, a lot of good information was disseminated. So I think that's all I have. All right. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I brought a few pictures from the last couple of weeks, if Crystal, you wouldn't mind bringing those up. So I wanted to note, um, and I know there's an item on the agenda tonight, that um, the county officially switched over for the first group of customers, of which um, there are many in San Carlos, uh, to the new Peninsula Clean Energy Service, which provides cleaner energy at a cheaper price than what is currently offered through PG&E. Uh, there was an official event on Thursday last week uh, kicking that off. As, as I had mentioned to my colleagues in the past, that we've seen um, a very low opt-out rate. So everyone is put into the new program and they have the option to opt out. Thus far, the opt-out rate has been less than one half of 1%, and I think that's due to the fact that it's cheaper <laughs> and it also uh, provides uh, greener energy. So I'm very pleased. It's been a great effort by the county. I've been really privileged to participate in it for about the past year or so, uh, and I'm glad we're taking up the agenda item tonight. Uh, let's see, I'll do that and I'll do that. Um, I had the opportunity to tour the San Carlos Airport um, on Friday, uh, which was really interesting to see. Uh, you know, the, the San Carlos Airport is, uh, is actually an incredibly busy airport. It has over 140,000 takeoffs and landings every year. It's growing um, rapidly. And, uh, you know, we now have some partial commercial service with Surf Air of the San Carlos Airport. So I got an opportunity to learn about the airport. Um, this is with uh, Gretchen Kelly, who's on my left, who's the airport manager, and uh, Rochelle, um, I think her name is Kiner, uh, who works for the county overseeing the airports on my right. We talked a lot about airport noise. I've started to hear a bit more from uh, residents about noise being generated by the airport. I actually got a call over the weekend from a gentleman who lives on the east side. Um, I was very pleased to hear that the folks at the airport are, are very sensitive to this. A lot of the comments recently have been about um, helicopters and, and the helicopter school. They said they're actively sitting down with their flight schools and looking at specific maps and, and trying to, to uh, direct them in ways where they're not hovering over uh, neighborhoods. So they're definitely listening. We want, if people are disturbed by the noise, we want them to continue to reach out. Um, and I know that the airport staff is uh, eager to work with residents to find ways to reduce any disturbance that's being caused by the airport. Uh, I had an opportunity to participate in a really cool event. Um, as folks may know, um, in the past year, we've um, added a live music venue to San Carlos, um, the Savannah Jazz Club on Laurel Street. Um, on my left is one of the proprietors, um, Dr. Pascal Thiam. And he had a very special guest who played on Saturday night, a gentleman by the name of Randy Weston, who's shown on my right. Randy, if you can believe it, is 90 years old. He looks great. Uh, he's a world-renowned jazz musician who's played with uh, Charles Mingus and others. He received the National Endowment uh, Art uh, Award um, as a jazz master, which is the highest award you can receive in jazz music. Uh, and it was his first time performing, obviously, in San Carlos, but I believe it might have even been the first time he performed in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So. Uh, I had an opportunity to present a little proclamation welcoming him, um, and there was a great crowd out there that was very enthusiastic, so it was, it was fun to have the opportunity to do that. One of the perks of being mayor. Um, I stopped by uh, the Boots, Blue Jeans, and Barbecue uh, event to benefit the Friends of the Adult Community Center. Um, Amy Newby from the Park and Rec Department was there as well. It was very well attended. Um, people were decked out in cowboy gear. There was some great food. There was some line, line dancing. Um, and you know, the Friends of the Adult Community Center raised $80,000 towards the um, renovation of the Adult Community Center, which happened over the past um, couple years. They're a great organization that really helps improve what is one of our you know, great facilities that helps build community in town. So I was very pleased to be a part of that. No video of you line dancing? I, I, did, not, I did not actually partake in the line dancing. I got to watch some. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Uh, I serve on the San Mateo County Transportation Authority as the uh, uh, representative for the Southern District. Um, 
we had a meeting. There were a couple interesting items. One in particular, we appropriated $65 million towards a grade separation on the Caltrain line for San Mateo, which is a huge project that's really important for that community. Um, we also kicked off some conversation about the Dumbarton corridor. So uh, there's been a lot of talk for many years about how to improve traffic flow. Um, it's pretty awful during rush hour. Um, and you have the, um, the vehicular bridge and then you have a rail bridge to the south. There have been talk for many years about putting um, commuter rail. Uh, but a, a, an ad agreement had never been reached. It required funding from both the Alameda County side and the San Mateo County side. And, and after many years of study, it's kind of broken down. So we're kicking off a new process to look at some less expensive alternatives, including um, a, something on the Dumbarton Bridge that would put three lanes in the dominant direction, uh, basically have a movable lane so that you get more expanded capacity during rush hour, like we've done in the Golden Gate Bridge for many years, and then looking at potentially doing something like bus rapid transit on the rail bridge, so expanding the rail bridge so it can handle buses going in one direction that would pick up at the Union City BART. So that's a, pr a process that's going to take about a year to study it. Uh, it's been, it's being funded partially by Facebook, which is, um, you know, cited right at the, at the base of the Dumbarton Bridge. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk about robots. So um, I had a very interesting conversation with a company called Starship, um, which produces the, the robots that are on the, sc on the screen here. These robots are intended to um, be delivery robots for things like uh, you know dinner delivery or package delivery. They have some uh, the, main, the main goal of them is to take um, delivery vehicles off the road. So they utilize city sidewalks. They're autonomous on the sidewalks and then they pull up to the curb and they radio back to headquarters and an operator drives them across the intersection and then they take off autonomously again. So um, they are looking for pilot cities to be able to operate in. They sent over a bunch of um, promotional and informational material, which I've circulated amongst our city staff. There was no one on city staff who said, hey, I see a major objection to this. Um, the company would like to come to the city council and give us a presentation about it. Uh, so I wanted to see if that would be the, the next step. Um, I wanted to see if anybody was interested in receiving a presentation about this program and um, whether we want to participate. I would. Sure. Okay. Sounds good to me. Okay. All right. Well, I, I will let them know. And uh, I also suggested that they might do something like come to the farmer's market with one of their robots and let, let the kids play with it. And, <laughs> The only comment that I got was that potentially negative was from uh, Chief Rothis, who said he was concerned that somebody was going to steal them. So, um, so uh, that is, I believe, my report for the evening. All right, we will move on to item 5B, which is staff comments on city administrative business. Mr. Malpe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of quick updates. Uh, we'll be holding a uh, shred event uh, at the uh, Shoreway Environmental Center on October 14th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. So anybody out there that has uh, wanting to do some uh, fall cleaning of their records in a secure and safe way and you've got documents that you'd like to get rid of and you can head on out there and do that this weekend. Also, the uh, annual citywide garage sale is going to be October 15th. So if you're going to participate in that, uh, you're running out of time. Uh, also, line 147, uh, there's a number of locations that the uh, inline inspection identified uh, should be looked at. So PG&E uh, started today uh, digging up uh, approximately eight more locations on the line. That work's going to continue through uh, just about Thanksgiving uh, and hopefully uh, Anything that needs to be replaced can be accomplished by then, but as you know, when you dig up pipes, sometimes you find uh, more than you were bargaining for. But that's all good news that they'll be uh, making those safety improvements to the line. At the same time those are going on, there are a number of sewer, uh, gas, and uh, water uh, mainline work that's happening on Britain. So we certainly uh, appreciate the patience from the public. Uh, I've driven, I, that's, I drive through there a couple times a day, so I know it's uh, pretty rough right now, but uh, bear with us as we uh, make sure that all this infrastructure is improved and safe and can continue to serve the community for decades to come. So that's my report tonight. Thank you. Oh, uh, one last thing. I have a introduction as well. Uh, our new lieutenant, uh, Christina Corpus, who uh, from the county, stand up, Christina. Hi. Hi. 
Christine will be backfilling for uh, Chief Rothis when he's on vacation or uh, out of the area. So you'll see her around occasionally. Excellent. Welcome. Mark? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, Jeff, uh, is there are, is there a plan to have PG&E come in and review the situation with line 147 with the council? I know I certainly would like to see that happen. I thought something like that might have happened already, but... Um. Yeah, there's been a, quite a few uh, meetings with uh, the staff, and we had kind of planned for sort of a wrap-up when, when, when PG&E believed that they were done with the work, but uh, as long as they kind of continued to identify new things to work on, we figured we'd hold off on the report. Uh, but we'll certainly get that to you uh, probably sometime in November, uh, unless you'd like it sooner, in which case you know, PG&E is always happy to come and talk with you guys. I don't know if Pers happy is the right word. I don't know how anybody else feels. Personally, I wouldn't mind, uh, wouldn't have minded an update by now. I mean, uh, I, I know you didn't necessarily mean it this way, but line 147, the phrase is line 147 and you never know what you're going to find don't make me feel very comfortable. So I wouldn't mind getting, you know, more updates. All right. Thank you, Mark. There was one last thing I wanted to mention, which is... Um, Excuse me, Mr. So, is there anybody, uh, am I the only one who's interested in that? I just want to, you know, if I am, that's fine. I know we have this rule that you have to have three people before we can... No, I, I'd be interested in it as well. I actually thought it was that he was going to do it, but... Um, I mean, I think we're just talking about timing. Is that right? Yeah. Jeff, when, when would you anticipate the uh, presentation would come before council? And I I'd anticipate it? by the end of November, but if you'd like it moved up, we can certainly, there's two meetings in, ahead of that, so we can certainly do that. So, I mean, I don't have an objection to end of November, but if you if you want to expedite it, Mark, we can. I I, um, I am leaning towards wanting to expedite it because, frankly, I would like to have had it already. Um, and would that be the next meeting or the meeting after that? Uh, uh, whichever one staff thinks they can get PG the right people from PG E to come in at. Very good. Okay. Okay. Um, Lastly, I just wanted to briefly mention that I had an opportunity to stop by the Home Protection Fair, and I wanted to just thank the staff. I saw Sergeant Pettit in the in the back. Um, I think you guys did a great job, and, and I got a lot of positive feedback, particularly from people with young kids who got an opportunity to uh, go inside of police cars or fire engines. So uh, thanks, thanks for doing that. Okay, um, now is the time for public comment for items not on the agenda. This evening, I have three speaker cards. Uh, and I'd like to invite you up. Our first speaker this evening is Leslie uh, D. Christopheri. Good evening. Hi, my name is Leslie D. Christopheri, and I'm Excuse here. Me, I apologize. We moved the mic. If you could move it, thank you so much. Do you want me to say my name again? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm here to talk about Ruby the oak tree. And um, we really have some issues with it. We don't want to see it come down. Um, we've had our arborists out there and um, we feel it was really unjust what they did. I think the city jumped too fast. And yes, there is some breakage in the sidewalk. It is lifted, but we ramped it. Um, I think there's other ways to correct the problem rather than get a 90-day notice. So I have made packets up, and it has our arborist report, all my correspondence with the city, and um, a copy of our little signage on our lawn. So hope you'll reconsider it. Thank you. Bill. Through the chair, could I ask the staff a question? You may. I think we have two additional speakers on this okay. topic. I may. Just one. Okay. Um, maybe maybe we'll hear the speakers and then we'll. Sure, we'll yeah. Uh, our next speaker is Dave De, uh, De Christoffery. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dave DeCristoffery, 2200 Eaton Avenue. Uh, Ruby is our white oak tree. It's uh, over 100 years old, all the uh, paperwork's there and everything else. The way the city went about it, 
is not correct. I mean, giving us a notice of, say, 90 days to cut it down, fix the sidewalks, or they'll cut it down and send us a bill. I mean, there's a lot of trees in the neighborhood, just in the White Oak area where I live, that have the same problem. And hopefully, the city's not going to go after them like they did us. And, you know, we had a number of people sign petitions, got the radio, TV coming out, and everything else. I mean, we want to save this tree, and there's really no reason to cut this tree down. I mean, Barbara gave the report, very healthy. Um, we have a meeting tomorrow with the, uh, yeah, with the uh, head of the public works, I take it. And uh, so we're going to see if we can do something. We gave a suggestion already for it, and they turned it down. You know, a little bulb out, lose a parking spot, big deal, but we saved the tree. And so hopefully tomorrow we can resolve this problem, and hopefully the city can make some changes to where other, you know, people in the city don't have to go through this. You know, so thank you very much. Thank you. Bob, you wanted to no. ask? Just going to ask Jay, apparently you have a meeting set up tomorrow, Jay. Is it your area, or is it Chris's, or who's? Good evening, Mayor, Members, Council, Jay Walter, Public Works Director. Uh, the meeting tomorrow is with myself and our city arborist and our inspector, and then I know Councilmember Collins is planning to be there. What and time is it tomorrow? It's uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow. And our, our plan is to, we, we have expressed to the D. Christopheries our desire to meet and talk about saving the tree. And I want to publicly apologize for the way that process played out because I know that that uh, created a lot of anxiety and angst for them. And the council members got a lot of phone calls as well as city staff. So I'm sorry that that happened that way. And I did, it will prompt some changes for how we will work the program in the future, especially recognizing that there are ways we can save the tree. So for tomorrow's meeting is specifically to find a way to save the tree and still create a, uh, a passable sidewalk in that particular location. So we'll make sure that we get back to you um, after we finish that and update you on the way that will work to save Ruby and leave her in place. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Um, just as an aside, no, I don't, I'm just as an aside, uh, the Bianchini's redid their parking lot and they had two, two trees. Now they weren't as big as that one, but they, they had somebody out there and they were able to rejigger it and get it all flat because they had the same issue with the, with the concrete coming up in their parking lot. And I'm not saying that you don't know how to do that. I'm not trying to imply that. But uh, they, they were able to save two trees over there. So uh, hopefully there's a way to, we can work it out. Thanks. Uh, I see lights on from Mark and Matt. Mark, do you have a brief question or comment? Uh, yes, I just wanted to, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to say that I was pleased to hear that, that staff is going to bring back uh, the results of their review of the process with some suggestions for, for changes. I'd like to ask that when that matter comes back, that it also uh, be written, defined in such a way that we can discuss um, potentially making changes to the heritage tree uh, policy that we have, the ordinance that we have. And specifically, what I'm thinking of is uh, 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 I'd like to make sure that there's at least some opportunity in there uh, to uh, perhaps uh, use public funds on occasion to help save these trees. I mean, to me, the whole point of having a heritage tree policy is that the trees are special and they mean something to the community. And that means the community ought to be willing to, to at least consider making investments in them on occasion. And I'm not saying that I don't know whether the council as a whole will adopt that, but I'd like when the matter comes back that it not just be a report on the, uh, uh, the process, but also on the policy. All right. Any objections to that? No. I think it's good. No. Okay. I think it's a good idea. All right. Matt? Just, just to clarify or, or to pick up on what Mark's comment was, I think what he's aiming at, and you can clarify if I'm misinterpreting, but I think what you're asking for is specifically for the uh, staff to take a look at situations where we have heritage trees that may conflict with uh, city infrastructure or you know things that public works is concerned about we're not talking about trees in people's backyards we have a heritage tree that would ordinance that protects that but I think what you're looking at is some things where we might uh, you know, head off at the pass, any problems where they're conflicting with sidewalks, curbs, streets, and so forth. 
Uh, yes, that, thank you for that clarification. That is the vast majority of what I was thinking of. Um, I, I'm also open, uh, as a, another aspect of this, to a discussion of if the tree, in your example, is totally on somebody's property, is what does that mean? I mean, you, I've been on the council, you and I have been here, when an issue came forward where people were taking down heritage trees that were on a property, and, and uh, I don't know what should be done that. I'm ha happy to have a discussion about that as well. Mostly I'm focused about the public property stuff. Very good. And then one other comment, uh, if it's all right with the mayor. Um, so you, it was mentioned that, that Ron would attend this meeting tomorrow. I'm willing to do the same. I think it'd be good to have a couple of council members there. Um, but, you know, I know Bob. Okay, Bob, okay. So if, if that's, yeah, and we can't have three. So, I'm not able to Mark attend tomorrow morning. Be able to do it. I don't know. Yeah. But. Actually, if you want to go, Matt, that's fine. Um, I spent quite a bit of time talking to the homeowners about this. Okay. I'd like to go tomorrow, but we can't have three people, so. No, that's fine. Why don't you go ahead, and I've got plenty on my calendar tomorrow, but sure. uh, yeah, yeah, I'm positive. All right, so, fine. Yeah. I'll do it. Thank okay. you. Okay, very good. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have one. Before we move on, just a point of clarification, uh, if you would, Mr. Mayor. Um, is the council wanting the Heritage Tree Ordinance to come back? I'm not sure. I think we were talking about just possibly doing a report or even just putting something in the council newsletter if this issue is resolved tomorrow and weren't necessarily planning a, a future agenda item on it. So before the opportunity slips away, I just want to what, clarify. What we heard was Jay saying we're going to look at the procedures and we'll come back and report on the Ruby situation. Right. But if you want an actionable item right. as opposed to just a staff report, that's two different things. I mean, it might have just been covered in, uh, up front on the agenda from me, so. Sure, so Mark, who you were making the suggestion, what, what was, what's your intention? I, uh, the reason I did, uh, made the suggestion, Mr. Mayor, is I do want it brought back as an, uh, an actionable item because there are some issues that I'm already familiar with involving heritage trees beyond the process that Jay is looking at uh, that I think are worth considering. And again, whether we change things or not, I don't know, but I think it'd be good to have the discussion. So one, we could take this in a couple of different ways. One way we could get the report and then have a discussion and give some council action after we educate ourselves. Um, secondarily, we could just ask for an action to come back immediately. I, I personally feel like I need a little bit more education, but I, I don't know what the, the will of the council is here. Oh, yeah, may I chime in? Yeah, please um, do. Um, I see what you're saying. Uh, I, I'm not at all adverse to, perhaps maybe the best way to describe it is that initial meeting beyond just a process discussion, I'd like to at least see as a study session type thing where we educate ourselves, give direction to staff if we decide we want to have, have stuff brought back. Um, and, and then so there may be a second actionable item after that. But is that, it's more is that than clear, Jeff? Okay. And Ron, you had a... Yeah, I just want to clear something up. Jeff, did you say that you were already planning something uh, to bring something up on this is that correct did i mishear that no i think the public works director earlier said that he was just planning to report out okay. on sort of what's going on and and to me that meant something different than i think the council initially was thinking and i wanted to make sure that if the council wanted the opportunity to actually discuss the heritage tree ordinance that we get that cleared up and get it on the agenda for you. So I think a study session would be appropriate based on what I'm hearing from the council right now. I'm, and I'm in support of that. Okay, excellent. All right, let's move on. Um, the last speaker card that I have is um, from Ken Castle. Good evening, Ken. Good evening, everyone. You know, I know uh, that we'd all like to be at home watching the Giants and Mad Bum take on the Cubs. Instead, we have to be here and talk about the curveballs we keep getting from public works in our neighborhood. I'm glad to hear that uh, Mr. Walter has apologized for the way this was handled. It's, it's, it seems to be that we are constantly back here asking you to manage this department so that we don't get these kinds of letters that are intimidating and disrespectful going out to homeowners about sidewalks with reports from internet trolls to homeowners like the uh, Castros, uh, I'll just say Dave and Leslie uh, on, on trees, and that we need to have a sea change in the way public works does things, in the way it communicates with residents, rather than sending out notices to chop down trees or dig up your sidewalk in 90 days. 
there's, there's better ways of handling this. We're a small town, but that doesn't mean that we can't have some interaction between city staff and homeowners. That's on a little bit more of a, of a friendly basis than issuing orders. And this has been consistent. Same thing with the sidewalk situation. There's real question about whether uh, sidewalk notices issued as a result of the troll uh, have some due process issues. And you may want to ask your legal counsel to investigate that, as I have done. So this is a serious matter. It's tied in with the, the tree situation, it's tied in with the sidewalk matter, uh, as Councilman Obert has suggested. It is something that the entire council should look at. If we are so obsessed with sidewalks and with damage to the sidewalks, granted, it's been a lot of years, 70 years or so in White Oaks where the damage uh, has occurred, many different things have caused a sidewalk damage, then maybe we ought to take a look at our budget and the infrastructure uh, needs that we have, we know we have them, roads, pipes, sidewalks, and see what we should do as opposed to say building a pedestrian bridge across the freeway on Holly where there are considerably fewer pedestrians using that than walking around on our uh, residential streets. And I also would invite you to take a look at the downtown streets and sidewalks where there are a number of, uh, of cracks and holes as well as the one right in front of the post office, for example. A lot of people walk there. So let's attack this on a rational basis. Let's do it on a, um, on a methodical timeline. Uh, street by street, as many cities already do. And let's look at a 50-50 sharing situation. I'm sure everybody in my neighborhood would appreciate having nice, clean sidewalks, but we don't appreciate ultimatums from Public Works. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. All right, I have an additional speaker card from our former mayor and friend from the Chamber of Commerce, Andy Klein. Good evening, Andy. Thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Uh, I sent all a letter with some dates and some upcoming events. As most of you have noticed, a member of the Chamber Board of Directors has been coming by pretty regularly to update you on what the Chamber of Commerce is doing. I'm just gonna cut to the part where, where what we're really here to say tonight, and that's thank you. We had our 26th annual Art and Wine Fair this weekend. It was a tremendous success. We did a couple of different things. We had a shuttle from PAMF, and uh, the weather cooperated, as all, as all of you know. We thank you for your attendance, but more importantly, we thank you for your support. We wanna say thank you to city staff, public works, the Sheriff's Department, and the Redwood City and San Carlos Fire Departments. Without the support from the City of San Carlos, we would never be able to put on an event like this. So we just want to know it's not, it doesn't go unnoticed and we wanted to say thank you. Have a good evening and uh, make sure Ron doesn't get back in time for the game to be over. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Andy. All right, that is all the speaker cards I have. Is there anyone else here this evening who wishes to speak on public comment for an item not on the agenda? Okay, then we will move on to item seven, approval of the consent calendar. Consent items are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on these items unless members of the council, staff, or public request specific items to be removed for separate action. Would anyone like to remove an item from the consent calendar? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion. Move approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Crystal, please call the roll. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grassilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. And Mayor Johnson? Yes. Now we'll move on to item eight, reports to council. Tonight we have a report to the city council providing a Wheeler Plaza parking and construction update. Good evening, Mr. Seve. Good evening, honorable mayor, members of the city council. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to make some introductions. There's a number of folks here that uh, could answer some questions as they arise, if necessary. We have a number of representatives here from KB Homes. Ray Panic, Senior Vice President. Jeff McMullen, Senior Vice President. We have Chap Akporan, Sub-Project Manager with KB Homes. Laura Tuchel, Outreach Coordinator. And Lisa Costa-Sanders, our Principal Planner. Um, I'd like to start with talking a little bit about um, some of the principles that, that we've had from the very beginning of this process. And it's really um, critical that um, we try and, and keep a business as usual uh, uh, working in the downtown as much as we possibly can and limit disruption as much as we can. We wanna assure that um, there's people know where to go, 
uh, that they have good assistance when they park in the valley assist parking lot and we want to be able to communicate effectively with folks and we want to be able to solve problems uh, as they arise so we encourage people to talk to city staff as problems come up I mean it's not going to be easy for us for a little while here and we all have to work together to move forward um, in terms of our timeline we've really reached a, a milestone event and this is one of the reasons we're before you tonight. Construction will finally begin, uh, and so we wanted to tell you what was happening uh, with that. And the uh, back in September, the property transferred from the city of San Carlos to KB Homes, so now KB Homes is the owner of the property. And this month, construction will begin in earnest, and it'll start with some undergrounding of utilities. And in October, you'll start to see demolition of some of the buildings. And then uh, moving out into, uh, into December and February, uh, where we're gonna see closure of the parking lot. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the timeline and walk you through it. And um, what you see here on the screen is uh, when I say Rule 20 undergrounding or uh, utility work, what I'm referring to is this red line here, and that's where the utility area would be, where, where the utility poles would be undergrounded along this area, and you see the, the blue footprint of the building, and that's gonna start hopefully just in the next week or two. And so people will start to begin to see people preparing for this work out there. And, and what's gonna happen with this work, it's gonna move in small increments around the edge of the property there. So I wanted to kind of show you uh, where the um, activity would take place and also talk about some of the dates. So let's say uh, it starts tomorrow, you'll see, start to see some preparation off of Cherry Street in the service alley there. And what'll happen is it'll, again, as I noted, it'll happen in small increments. So we'll see some of those parking spaces will be taken offline during the day. They will be available at night, um, but it's gonna go around the parking lot as you can see here. And there's different dates for that. For instance, this, this section, uh, of the service alley and part of the driveway for Wells Fargo would be through uh, starting October 25th. And as you can see, it just kind of moves down, down the road there out to uh, San Carlos Avenue, uh, November, 29, November 9th through the 23rd. And then finally over to Walnut Street, uh, December 28th through December 2nd. And um, so during this time, for instance, this parking lane would be closed and you'll have people out there hel helping people to be able to drive around that area and we'll uh, uh, make sure that traffic flows in that area during that time. Um, northbound Walnut Street will be closed December 2nd through the 9th, same thing. We'll try and get people through there. There'll be uh, construction workers out there directing traffic. And then, starting at the end of October, we'll start to see demolition of the buildings that the, the city uh, has transferred over. Um, the, we'll start with the Foodville, the uh, former Foodville building, and that would be here. So here's the sequence. It's the blue, uh, the red, which is the commercial area along San Carlos Avenue, and then the Walnut Street apartments would be demolished. And as you can see, some of the uh, parking area in Wheeler Plaza would be impacted a little bit, as would some parking along San Carlos Avenue during this time. Then, at the end of November uh, through December, the parking lot for the Foodville site would be constructed. And there's, um, there's a fair amount of preparation for doing that. There's lots of things underground that need to be taken care of. And so uh, there would be a fair amount of activity for a while until that is put into place. So about the end of December, that would be constructed. And then we'll, once that uh, is, is finished, the... Uh, construction site would be fenced. Actually, I wanted to back up just a little bit here and note that at the end of December, you'll see there's about a month before December right to February there, there's about a month where the uh, Wheeler parking area, this new valet assist area where the former Foodville building was, uh, would be open. So we're gonna have this open before the entire um, uh, parking lot is closed so that people get used to the idea of parking in that valley area before the entire parking lot is closed. So it'll be about a month 
where or so where people will be able to park in there and also be able to park in Wheeler Plaza. And then once that occurs, um, about the uh, beginning of February, the entire lot would be closed and uh, turned over to the general contractor. As I've known, I've shown you this slide before the map of the downtown, and it shows the, the walking distances from the various places that um, we're asking people to park. And as, as noted, the, one of the key parking areas would be this area on, San Car on Laurel Street uh, at the old Foodville building, and there would be a valley assist there, and also the Sam Trans building. So we encourage people to park in these locations, particularly the employees of downtown, um, and you've got some walking distances. We know this will be an inconvenience for, for folks, um, but we're encouraging people to use that Sam Trans parking garage and there will be some benefits for the employees of downtown. Uh, we will be eliminating the um, employee permit parking in Wheeler Plaza and then some along the rear of Clark Plaza here, and that's to turn the ones in Clark Plaza over to customer parking, again, encouraging the employees to park over at the Sam Trans building. And also, uh, later on in, in this area along El Camino, the permit folks will be able to park in this location. So the uh, Sam Trans parking garage actually um, is opening a little early. We're getting that open in early November. Uh, you will have three hour valley assist parking there and that's uh, an hour more than we have at Wheeler Plaza now in the downtown. For the employees that come and get their, their free permit passes, they will have free all day parking in the Sam Trans parking garage. Again, we know it'll be an inconvenience, but you don't have to move your cars as many of the employees do now. And uh, we've already started, we, we really started on this early in terms of enforcing the parking in the garage and getting the Sam Trans employees ready for this as well. And um, along the tracks, that'll open uh, in January 2017 for construction workers and also for those permit uh, holders. Just to back up a little bit and, and re-describe uh, for folks about the Valley Assist program. The idea is that, and in, in one of the things we found out in talking to people at the very beginning is that people don't like to relinquish control of their, of their cars. They would prefer to keep their keys. So if you are able to get there uh, when some of these uh, parking spaces are available, the Valley Assist person will allow you to keep your keys. You can park in the, in the lot and, and go downtown. If you do have to park behind somebody else, you will have to leave the keys with the, with the valet. And in terms of directional signage, we want to make sure that people know where to go. So we've reevaluated all the uh, signage in and around this area, and we are going to see new signage installed in the area. And um, some of it you'll see the Impark logo on to remind people that there's the Valley Assist program working at the Foodville site in Samtrans. We've done a good deal of outreach to date. Uh, we've had a lot of number one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with folks. We've uh, had um, some presentations across town. We've mentioned it to people. We have some things out on, uh, around the site in terms of posters and things like that. So we've done a fair amount of outreach. Sent out a uh, letter earlier uh, this month to the, uh, the businesses around downtown so that their employees know what's going on. And upcoming outreach, we'll continue with that. Spotlight newsletter coming up. Um, we're going to have a uh, meeting with the businesses, another meeting with the businesses down at the library next Wednesday, October 19th at 8 a.m. So I would encourage people uh, to go to that and get some more information. And a uh, project website has been set up by KB Homes. You can go to wheelerplaza.com. You can sign up for updates there. You can also go to the city's website and get on e-notify for this project. And um, if we, again, uh, uh, I'd like to encourage folks to go ahead and give us a call. We've had a lot of folks working on this already for quite some time now. We're already troubleshooting with construction in the downtown area. And we look forward to working with uh, the citizens of San Carlos and the businesses and employees as well. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Questions for Al, Bob? Al, I've got a couple of questions here for, I guess, quick ones. 
So when we start to demolish the, uh, if you go back to one of the screens, you you elim eliminate a lot of the parking on San Carlos Avenue at various times. Um, one of, some of the earlier ones, you, there's lines in the, there, like any one of those. Yeah. Are you going to take a lane out also? No, I don't believe so. Okay, so is San Carlos correct? is... No lanes. No lanes. So on San Carlos Avenue, it's still going to be two lanes. Right. Okay, great. Um, so let's assume that you're working on various parts of it, but the parking lot is still open. Okay? Is there going to be then access that we'll be able to walk from the parking lot to Wells Fargo Bank? or to uh, uh, the other stores that are there? There would be one uh, uh, short period of time where the Wells Fargo parking area would be closed. Right. If you're gonna walk from Wheeler, that would be closed for a, a short period of time. You won't be able to go in the back door? I don't believe so, no. That's right. Okay. You can't go in the back door, yeah. Starting... For, I'll, I'll show you here. Let, okay. me, let me see if I can find that. This thing isn't scrolling great, but... Uh, let me see if I can delicately get us to the slide there. Could you get me back out to the... Okay. So that week will be the only time that you can't get to the businesses? Yes. During the time of the Rule 20 undergrounding, this is it right here. There's the slide, October 20. No access from, from the parking lot to any of those uh, businesses? Um, you could actually go down the alley next to it behind Blue Line Pizza and get out to Laurel Street. So that area would not be impacted. But you won't be able to go in the back door of Wells Fargo Bank. That's correct. Okay. I say that because my elderly aunt, we have to, I have to figure out what to do with her. So. Okay. Yeah. Um, how about, is there going to be vehicle access on the, where that red line is? Um, when does that stop? When does the vehicle access stop for deliveries Go and things? And ask and, uh, Chap or somebody from KB Homes to try and answer that question for us. You need to come up, sir, please. I'm just curious what the timeline is when nobody can deliver or nobody can drive in there. Hi. Hi. Chap, I'm Carl with KB Home. Pleasure. So, um, talking about the entrance from Cherry Street, right? So you can in, you can enter. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, you can enter from Cherry Street uh, um, at that period of time. Now, the green area is basically what we say is the uh, traffic control area. So, a vehicle cannot go through there, but we will make the pedestrian accessible to the businesses all the time. Of course, that's not just what you said. So, I'm thoroughly confused. Uh, I, the, Al said I can't get from the parking lot to the Wells Fargo Bank walking. Sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, Council Member Gasilli, I would listen to Chap on this one. Okay, He's the construction fine. guy. Yeah. I, that's fine. I'm, I'm just trying to get the answer because when I show up, I want to know whether I can take her, my aunt there or not. It's personal. So, or anyone else who wants to walk to the bank yes, from the can. back. So there will always be access, always be access to Wells Fargo Bank? That's correct. From the back? That's correct. We met, we met with Wells Fargo, we confirmed That's fine, I'm just asking the yeah. question. And, and how about the restaurant, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, little store, uh, the um, um, Blah Blah Boulanger and Boulanger? Um, that might be a little difficult on the back door if we're working at that particular uh, okay. area on that day. Okay, but theoretically there's going to be access. Yes. So then how about the vehicle traffic coming in from Cherry Street? Is there anybody that's going to be able to go down and deliver along that line? Not in the parking lot, not to park, but deliver, delivering. Yes, they can. Okay, so you'll be able to figure that out. Yes. And the last question I had is, when you talked about Clark Plaza, are you going to eliminate all the permit parking then and, and when that happens? Thank you. When that happens, eliminate all the permit per 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 parking in Clark Plaza? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Al. Um, some questions here just uh, in, in no particular order, but leave this slide up here uh, for a split second. So that, uh, the Wells Fargo parking lot, is that part of the public parking area or is that actually private parking? This is public in here and right. this is Wells Fargo private Wells Fargo parking in this area. You probably answered this next question some time ago for me, and I don't remember the answer to it, but after this project is completed, how does that private parking lot get used? People come in and out of it off of Laurel, uh, off of Laurel Street? Because right now it's a one-way thing. Yeah, they'll still be able to access it from this driveway here. So this will still, this will remain open 
for service vehicles or for people who are going to use this parking area. Um, theoretically, well, that's the best way to go. I mean, I was thinking they could change the direction of the parking, but that wouldn't it's work for folks. Pretty tight. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question I had is, uh, um, I appreciate you laying out for us the timeline of the various impacts here, uh, but an overlay on top of that is we also have John Bear's project going on literally right next door here. Um, uh, and that wasn't necessarily anticipated when the, pl the plans were drawn up. Um, what confidence do, can we take that, I mean, have the potential conflicts and issues of delivering construction material and vehicles and whatnot been worked out? Because it's, it's a, uh, you know, I can see where you could have a lot of problems there show up all, all of a sudden. Um, Chris Valley, building official. Uh, the permit for 644 Laurel Street is ready to issue uh, to the contractor that's performing phase one of that work, which is the um, parcel next to Comerica. It's my understanding that Mr. Bear has been in contact with um, the developers of Wheeler Plaza to coordinate both the underground work and um, <clears throat> I believe access to the rear of these buildings. Um, and I'm I'm not sure if Mr. Panic can add anything to that or, okay. So th there's been dialogue with the two developers to coordinate their efforts is what I'm trying to get at here. Um, and uh, what, and I think I know the answer to this, but I'm gonna ask it anyway, Chris. Uh, what recourse, if any, does the city have if it turns out that the, uh, I'm not anticipating this would happen, but it turns out the dialogue doesn't necessarily result in avoiding problems? Then we have a meeting with uh, the two developers and Dolores Montenegro, and we try to work it out. Okay. If, 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 there's, if, if there arises an issue, we, we have two significant projects going on right now, and we've taken every reasonable measure to address things that can happen. That's not to say that more things could happen throughout the phase of this construction. If that happens, we engage the two uh, builders and we find a solution to what is going wrong or what, what, what the issue is and what the congestion is with the two builders. And by the way, I presume there's, there's nobody here from Bear's project on the construction I side? I don't believe so. But no. do, do we, is, can, can I be confident that you guys are committed if there are issues, you will do your best to work them out? Absolutely. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Um, the, um, uh, my other question relates to something, Al, that that uh, I think I talked about once before when, when John was, was talking to us. Um, I appreciate all the outreach that staff and, and uh, the developers are doing, but I still remain very concerned that this whole thing is gonna come as a huge surprise to a lot of people. Um, and you may recall that I, I asked last time about could we possibly put up some banners, literally so as people are driving into Wheeler Plaza, they see something that sort of says, good news, new parking space is coming, bad news is you ain't gonna be able to park here really soon, okay? Go to this website, figure out what to do. Um, because I just had a conversation with somebody earlier today who, uh, uh, the essence of which was, they had absolutely no idea that there was anything going on involving Wheeler Plaza at all, and they're a lifelong resident in San Carlos and reasonably well connected. So help me out here. Um, are we taking advantage of everything we can to actually try and get the message into people, not just through social media and whatnot, but literally as people are driving up to the lot so they see, okay, I'm not gonna be able to drive here too much longer? Yeah, I mean, we, we do have posters, and I, my understanding, and you know, I haven't been out there for a few days, but uh, my understanding is that some, some of those posters are on the businesses in that area, and they should be on the Foodville building and that kind of thing. So we do, we have that, um, that information out there physically at the site, and there will be more. Um, you know, we just sent a letter to the merchants and things. And, you know, I mean, I get that too. I mean, some people just don't don't know what's going on. I mean, it, it, we do, we, we certainly try um, to do our best and, and, if, and we're open to suggestion. If there's, if there's new ways to get the information out, um, we're, we're happy to try something new. Well, I, I will reiterate again my earlier request that if you aren't planning on doing it already, I really think putting a banner up along the backside of these buildings so that people walking in and out of the parking lot are just gonna see it right in front of their face um, is, is something worth considering. Thank you.
We're also planning on doing a number of uh, direct outreach to the community that kind of coincides with when the buildings are demolished because we, we feel that once the buildings actually come down, the collective consciousness in San Carlos is really going to tune in and, and sort of the, the, the small town communication network that exists here is really going to help us get the word out and there's about six to eight week period of time before the parking lot actually closes. So I agree. Once, once stuff starts coming down big time, people are going to realize they need to learn something. I'm just trying to make it less painful for everybody by getting them to learn a little bit ahead of time. Bob, you wanted to add something no, on this I, point? I concur or? completely with Mark. Uh, I park my car. I don't get anywhere near those buildings. I walk through the little blue line pizza to go across the street to eat. I'm not looking at those buildings. I'm not looking at posters. I'm not looking at anything. I suggested this earlier. I guess I didn't say it loud enough, but I'll concur with my colleague. Let's put up a frigging sign, a big sign. This parking lot will close on a certain date. Be aware. Seriously, on both entrances. We, if you need a donation, I'm happy to write a check, okay? Honestly. I can guarantee you, and I say this because our phones are going to bring it off the hook. They're going to be ringing off the hook anyway, which is fine. I get that. It's not a problem. But there, the, I don't care how much social media you do. I don't care how much. There's no way that people are going to know. They're not even looking at those things. They're just parking their car and they're going to eat. Or they're going across the street, honestly. I mean, I really think we should put up a big, as Mark said, either a banner or a sign. I'm not trying to spend a million dollars. Or two, one at each side. This thing will close. You don't have to put all the different dates, but specific thing. This whole parking lot's going to be under construction starting X, and it will close at Y. I really think that's a good idea. I, I don't know about my colleagues, but I'll, uh, if you manage to get Grisilli to write you a check, I'll match it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank uh, you. I, I think I, we can handle it in our budget. So I apologize I for being so passionate, but, but I Thank honestly you. concur with my colleague that, that I would guarantee you that so, I don't know what the percentage is. There's a whole bunch of folks that are going to be going like, what? I agree completely. Anyway, yeah, okay, so thanks. I, I, I concur, and Sorry. and if there's any, let me. Is there any objection from anybody here about that idea? I, you don't want to sign? No, I actually do, and I, if I can chime in. Sure. If we want to close um, this. I said long before we ever got to this point that when you know we we had. Uh, the old carpet store sitting there for a long, long time, and then we had some other empty storefront. There's a lot of storefront there, and it'd be real easy, even beyond the parking lot. This developer's got renderings of what this is going to look like, and you've got all that storefront that looks like garbage right now that could look very nice for a month before you demo those buildings, or it, it, actually that building, the, the red box is gonna come down at, way after October 24th, because your first building to tear down is Foodville. Use that storefront to your advantage. Let's put up some, you know, you can go to ARC right here in San Carlos and have some film made with renderings of your project and put it on that storefront so people know what the heck's going on. People walk down that sidewalk all the time going downtown. It, we just missed a huge opportunity with the Art and Wine Fair to do that. But let's do it. I've said that a long, long time ago, and it's never been done. And it's really unfortunate. And I think we should do it. And, and, and you combine that with what these guys are saying about the parking lot's going to be closed, people will start paying attention. So I think that would be helpful. I've got some other questions yeah, later, I, but I did want to Mark. Yeah. Were you done with your questions? Did you have any additional? Um, well, let me just let me just yeah, close out the signage for a second because I know there's a lot of focus on it. So, Al, do you want to respond? Do you, is there any objection to? I think there's a lot of desire to oh, want to have some physical signage out talking about both when the parking lot's going to close and what the project's going to look like to coincide. Well, I mean, effective immediately, but definitely to co coincide with the beginning of construction. No, I think it's a great idea. And, um, you know, we have some small posters in there that have been up for a couple of weeks, but you're right. I mean, it, it, and it's great to get this kind of guidance uh, from okay. you so that you're not surprised if we do put up a giant sign. So, um, no, we'll, we'll go forward and get it done. Okay. Through the chair. Yes, Matt. I honestly think also at this point mr Malpe said you know we can cover it the council members don't have to do it I, I don't think it should be the public's money and i don't think it should be my colleagues up here i think it should be those guys back there they're the developer and they own the property now so let them put the signs up all right 
Mark, did you? Um, I just had uh, um, one other question, uh, Al, which you touched on briefly. Um, the pedestrian traffic flow dur during construction, is the expectation that people will still be able to use, for example, the si most of the time, the sidewalk on San Carlos Avenue and on the portion of Laurel Street in front of where the old Foodville building is? Uh, most of the time. Um, yeah, I know there are going to be some times when they, they right. can't let people through. Yeah, so um, there will be some times when um, that won't be available. And um, like during this uh, period of time, November 9th through the 21st. And um, maybe uh, Chap could weigh in on this one, but um, during the uh, major part of the construction of the, of the parking garage and such, um, do you anticipate that um, San Carlos Avenue would be open or the, the sidewalk along there? Is that, yes, okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. Th thank you, Al. And by the way, I, I very much support uh, Matt's suggestion about putting up renderings of what this is gonna look like, not just to warn people about the loss of parking, but what they're getting for all the inconvenience. And I wanna thank Al, I wanna thank you for, uh, I know some months ago I had suggested that you start encouraging developers around town to do that, and I've been noticing since we had that conversation that more and more of them are putting up renderings, and I think that's a great idea. Great. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Matt? So a couple of questions. One, when you were talking to Mr. Rusilli about the uh, Wells Fargo alley, I, I'm unclear if a vehicle can come in off of Cherry and follow that red line and then uh, zip out through Wells Fargo's uh, side lot there and back onto Laurel Street. Jeff? So what we have worked out with our businesses is that uh, we will make available the lane for delivery truck that they needed to service their businesses. All they have to do is just, okay, you know, we're all around, come by and let us know, okay, we need to let the truck through, then we'll move out our equipment, put a trench plate down, they go through, and we'll get back on the road. But what I'm not understanding then, I guess, is you're, you're talking about delivery trucks. What I'm talking about is, you know, Bob Grisilli with his aunt in the car who wants to come in or any, you know, I'm saying that sort of jokingly, but we, we have a lot of elderly who are in exactly the situation that Bob's aunt is in that come down with, you know, I see elderly people downtown all the time who are down there with, um, you know, what's very common, you know, my wife is Filipina and there you see a lot of Filipinos that are senior aides and you see them downtown with their clients and doing things. And the, you know, the shock of coming in and not being able to take your client to the bank because you can't get there would be problematic. And there has to be a way to, to solve those kind of situations. And furthermore, I'm a little confused that if you come in off of Cherry and you just think, I'm gonna access this parking lot because it's still open, would, you know, right now you have to, come in and then jog to the right and then jog to the left and then you can go down the aisles that way. But if you can't do that, if you can't follow that red line where you're coming in off a of cherry and jog to the right, jog to the left and then you know, enter the parking lot that way, that's also gonna be a, an issue. So the red line represents in the joint trench that we'll be installing. And at, at uh, basically every end of the work day, we will make that lane available. So what it meant is we either backfill or put a trench plate over so it'd be still one big lane without them having to go, you know, worry about the lane being smaller or try to adjust himself uh, through the work. That's during the day or during the evening? At, at the end of the work day, we'll put a uh, plate down. But on, on, a, on a work day, right? So if you work at that spot, that obviously that area will be off limit for public to drive through. But as the work is done on that day, then we'll put a trench plate over the trench so the traffic will be restored. So there is going to be some time, uh, 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 I don't know how long, but there's going to be a time where during the day you won't be able to access Wheeler Plaza, never mind it's still open, 
you won't be able to access it from Cherry Street. You'll have to come in off of Walnut. Absolutely, that's correct. That's the first phase of the parking lot construction. Okay, so what are we going to do for those folks who come along there and think, I want to pull in, and then they find out they can't? Uh, we have traffic control plan in place, so there'll be signage that it placed, and also there's be barricade, so they can't just actually and turn into sure. the area. Sure, okay. Any, there'll be signage that, ex, that says enter off of Walnut Street or something to that there'll sort. There'll be a detour site. A detour site, okay. I mean, I, I can see where some problems will come up with that, but people have to work it out. Um, so my next question, I think, is for our staff. Thank you very much. Um, can I just add something? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to remind the council that that valet assist parking lot at Foodville, um, or excuse me, the, the parking at um, Samtrans will be open on November 7th. So that'll alleviate a lot of the parking congestion in this area as well. There'll be an alternative. And they're going to have a lot of signs out there to advertise that. And then in January, uh, the Foodville lot will be open, and we're going to give priority for accessible parking there as well. And so that's a very short distance to walk. So I know that doesn't alleviate the specific issue immediately, but there are alternatives for customers to get downtown. Okay, that's good. Um, the, the, the issue I see, Lisa, is especially initially people trying to do things that they're used to, and it's going to be those first couple of weeks, and I think having even more than just signage, but maybe if a person could be provided at some of these place, these key places, so that when a person's confused and says, you know, what the heck do I do? There's somebody there to say, you can go this way, some guy in a vest or something like that. And in addition, yeah. um, Laura Tuchel is working on outreach materials for each of the businesses. Mm -hmm. She's already prepared those, talked to the businesses, and they're customized for those. So we don't need Wells Fargo to take the burden of what's going on, where am I going right. to park? They could say, well, here's the information. And so she's got cards developed that each of those businesses can hand out to their customers starting immediately and start educating their customers as well. Before this actually yeah, exactly. And yeah. she looks good in an orange vest, I understand. So, right idea. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, so, the other question I have is simply about, it, you know, you may not have an answer for this, and I'm trying to look at these dates and try to, you know, think about this in my mind a little bit, but, um, you know, we've got the uh, goblin walk with and those that's a huge event you know we've got people from coming out of town to go to that now and then we've got uh, the Christmas or whatever we call it now the uh, festive festival of lights event another big event coming up and so just having some appreciation for what this might do to those events and how you coordinate that I see Amy going like this so I guess there's some thoughts about that already all right. Thank you, Matt. Ron? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, just for the record, about 20 minutes ago when Mark was speaking, I had written down uh, the possible sign. This parking lot will close on October whatever, so <laughs> took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah, let the record show. Um, uh, one question I had was when people are directed to the Samtrans parking lot, in other words, to, they just want to go there, they don't want to valet. Are they going to be directed to the underground lot or the parking structure that's above ground? The above ground. The above ground. Yeah. So the, and, and that, I've been in there a few times and there's been um, sometimes very few uh, spaces available. Are they changing who parks there or, or, or their personnel uh, policies so that there will be more uh, spaces available? Yes. So uh, in concert with Samtrans, what we've done is uh, work with them to educate their employees that they should use the lower floors and that the city will use the upper floors. And so, and that's part of the enforcement policy that we've got in place there. So they've been um, using this idea for quite some time now, actually, and they're pretty much used to it at, uh, about now. There's a few things that we're working out, but that's the way that um, they're trained already to, to use the parking lot, and that's how we'll use it. Great. Thank you. Through the chair, I just had one quick question. There, you cannot take a left-hand turn off of Laurel Street to get into that parking lot. Just to let you know, you can't do it. You got to go to Walnut. So mm -hmm. I hopefully yeah. have a great signage because if you're on Laurel and, and if you're at that, if you're at the Foodville spot when it's wide open and the gentleman goes go park in the Sam Trans lot, don't send them on Laurel Street. Tell them they have to go to Walnut because they can't take a left hand turn. 
Okay, I mean, I just want to make sure everybody understands it's a one-way, unless you want to turn it around, you can, but I'm just, uh, right at the moment, it's a one-way coming off of Walnut, so everybody Excellent. better yeah. better get that one squared away. The entrance to the garage, the to the garage is Yeah, I know, I know that, and that's what I'm saying, you can't take a left, but even if it's not, you can't take a left off of Laurel. So anyway, just... Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, I see a bunch more lights on. I, I, let me ask a few questions and then I'll kick it back to my colleagues. Um, so I, I just want to ask um, about the delay. Uh, so if you, if you could just touch on the, the source of the delay. Um, I know this project was initially talked about to start at the beginning of the summer, uh, then it was August, uh, and now, now it's October. So. Just, you know, it's the purpose is to learn from, you know, what went on here and, and how can we think about other projects in, in the future. So I'd just be interested to have a, an answer to that. Okay, Mr. Panic. <laughs> I'd like, yeah, my, I mean, you know, I guess I'd have to ask you to answer that. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, my name is Ray Panic. Uh, I'm the senior vice president for planning. It's nice to be with you this evening. Uh, well, what, what happened with the delay? I, I, there were um, a number of things that um, were some of which were on our side, putting together the parking plan. Uh, I would say probably the one of the major things was um, uh, coming to terms with a fi our financial partner on this project which took a little more time than, than we anticipated in documenting that, that agreement and arrangement. Uh, took some more time. Uh, I think there was, there was a little more work on some, in, on some engineering plans. It's a complicated project. It seems rather simple. But um, working through the details of that what was important going into this with uh, the purchase and, and the complications of uh, impacting the uh, neighborhood and the other businesses. But those, I think, were the, the primary things. I, I really want to say that, <clears throat> from my perspective, uh, doing this work in communities all over the Bay Area, I, I'd just like to uh, congratulate your staff. And you have an excellent staff to work with. Uh, and I'm not, I mean that sincerely. Um, uh, an example of that, I asked the building official, I said, well, when we submit our plans, um, when can I expect a turnaround? He said, it'll be 15 days. I said, no, really, when can I expect a turnaround? He said, it'll be 15 days. We got the plans in 15 days, and that's, that's remarkable. But that, that's principally the, the, the delay we had. The other, the other thing, just so that you know, there, you, you might look at these dates that were presented to you this evening and say, well, okay, so we're done with the joint trench work itself, um, but we're still not starting the project, the actual construction, digging the hole to build the parking garage. The reason for that is that we then, once we have the joint trench in place, we basically have to get in the queue with our friends at PG&E to get the, the poles removed. And uh, unfortunately, uh, PG&E is a very busy organization these days uh, all around the Bay Area. And so that's uh, also, there's probably, depending if we can squeeze them or where we move, that could move the schedule up uh, anywhere from uh, a month to six weeks, I would say. But uh, that, that's pretty much where we stand today. All right. Pardon, you it might rain. It might rain, that's true. All right, thank you, thank you very much. It never rains on constructions. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, this is a question maybe for Al, maybe for Jeff. Can you remind us, um, we appropriated a certain amount of money for outreach and preparation um, for the Wheeler Plaza project. Um, can you remind us how much we appropriated and how much is remaining, if you know? I, I, I had the number half a million dollars in my, and do you, do you know how much we've expended uh, and how much is remaining? Uh, I don't. Um, we can certainly get you that number. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's probably maybe in the range of 100000 has been spent so far. Something okay, like so that. that. It would be great if you could send us an email later. But, um, but basically what you're saying is there's a lot of money in the back bank yes. for outreach, for um, anything that may go wrong to, to address it. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and then 
I wanted to ask, so when we talked about this in the past, we've talked about getting regular reports. Do you guys have planned when the next report back to the council will be? Um, we don't have a date certain, but but we um, are very cognizant of the fact that, you know, we want to get to you before anything really, anything big happens. And that's one of the reasons we're, we're here tonight. Before our shovel goes in the ground, we wanted to talk to you. And I think that's the same uh, sort of philosophy we will have moving forward. Um, I think uh, if I believe the council uh, wants regular uh, updates, we're, we're certainly happy to do those. All right. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think we want regular updates. So. Yes. Okay, uh, Mark, you had some additional questions. Yes, I did. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Al, can you um, uh, two things? Can you remind me a little bit about what the uh, some of the details on your social media outreach are? And I'm thinking specifically of uh, using Nextdoor, which seems to be a hotbed for circulating information like this or misinformation about projects like this. So are we embracing that and, and doing what we can to get information out there? Uh, we do use social media, but we don't um, use Nextdoor um, for uh, various reasons. Um, we do use Facebook, Twitter, that kind of thing. Um, we use the city's uh, website, and, uh, but we don't typically use or go to Nextdoor. Um, for what it's worth on something like this, I, I would strongly recommend to staff that you find a way to do that. I have some thoughts we can talk about offline about how you could do that, because I remember what some of the issues are you're referring mm -hmm. to. Um, the other question I had is, can, can you give us an update on uh, where things stand vis-a-vis um, -vis Blue Line Pizza with that adjustment that we talked about some months ago that has to be made with the little parking lot there since they have access and rights to some of that stuff, some of that same space? Yeah, I mean, we've been working with Blue Line Pizza. They're aware that the city's interested in that strip of land. We've um, had um, an appraisal done, and we've provided that to the property owner, and we're still uh, discussing acquisition of that uh, piece of land with the property owner. So we haven't, we haven't uh, finished that negotiation. But there's no, um, and I ask this next question because I still uh, see people doing a fair amount of uh, stopping to pick up pizzas from their rear window, the rear door there, and on occasion it backs up traffic out on, onto Laurel Street itself, um, which I can only imagine would be really problematic once construction starts and that's lots being used for something else. So do you anticipate that that'll get resolved uh, before it becomes an issue? What we've talked about is making the uh, parking spaces in front of Blue Line on Laurel short-term parking maybe 20 minute or 15 minute parking. So that's one of the things that we've talked about to try and remedy that situation and, and help Blue Line uh, continue to do the kind of business that they wanna do. Um, they're really not supposed to do that. And in particular, you know, it becomes a safety issue and a traffic issue if, when they back out onto Laurel. But um, we think that, that doing this could accommodate their needs. That's actually not a bad solution, as you said, for for a lot of reasons. Um, if that's something that we could we could find our way to doing, and yes, I know that people aren't supposed to do that, but there's a big difference between yeah. supposed to and what actually happens. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Matt. Yeah, I forgot to ask this question, and with uh, um, sheriff's department in the back there, perhaps they could address this. Uh, the concern I have is with all the moving pieces of parking, I could see a lot of spillage into the residential areas and then even some of the areas of downtown where it's mostly residential, um, but it is monitored parking where they go around and you know mark the wheels and allow two hours. So what do they foresee in either increased enforcement. I, I know where I live in the downtown and, and where I live, it's sporadic. Sometimes the uh, enforcement little buggy comes by and marks the, the tires and other days they don't come by at all. You just never know. So, um, and, and in addition to that, I would think there potentially could be an issue. There already is sort of an issue with CVS. The managers all the time having to monitor uh, people parking at CVS who really are going to the Samtrans building for a real estate business. Um, 
So, you know, helping them out with their situation too, because I could see uh, there being an impact on, on their business and their lot being used by people who aren't their customers. Exactly. Uh, uh, Steve Pettit, Administrative Sergeant for the Sheriff's Office in San Carlos, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, parking is, is a major issue. And we all know it, and that's why most of this is, is happening the way it is, is trying to get out, get the information and such that's out there. Um, the Sheriff's Office currently has one full-time uh, parking enforcement officer. Uh, we are uh, bringing on a second full-time parking enforcement officer uh, to address the issues that are downtown, along with the GESC uh, issues that we have on the east side. Um, but we are always available for uh, discussion, renovation, innovation, uh, to look at uh, uh, ways of managing the, the traffic yeah, in and about the downtown area. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't have any public speaker cards on this topic, and I don't, I don't see if there's anyone who'd wish to speak on public comment, we could take that now. Um, and I'll just close by saying a couple things. First, I just want to um, give my thanks to staff, to Al and your team. You know, um, this is first and foremost. It should be stated that you know this is a very exciting project for our community. It adds a, a huge public benefit. It beautifies our downtown, um, and this is an exciting milestone. I mean, we're on the cusp of starting development. This made us all and made a lot of members of uh, larger stakeholder members of our community, you know, very nervous when we started to talk about it. And all I can say is that at this point, we are set up for success. <laughs> uh, I'm certainly hopeful that this will be a, a successful project. Surely it will be disruptive, but um, I think you guys have done an excellent job in getting us to this place. So thank you very much. Um, and then I just want to say to our, our construction partners, we, we appreciate you guys too. Um, and I know you guys are professionals and you'll do a great job. I just want to say that, you know, we are a small community. Uh, this is not a construction project that's happening on the corner of town, fenced off where no one walks. This is perhaps the most uh, heavily trafficked area of our city. Uh, it's an incredibly sensitive, uh, play it's an incredibly sensitive site that's going to affect uh, almost everyone in our town at some point over the life of the construction, and it requires a very delicate, very thoughtful, very sensitive touch. I hope that you communicate that from the manager on site all the way down to the individuals who are, are working on the project. Um, we, we want this to be successful for everyone involved. We want it to be successful for our community. We are going to be watching this very closely, uh, and if issues do come up, we're going to be taking um, you know, swift action to remedy them. But we want to work closely together uh, in a spirit of uh, cooperation and goodwill to, to get a great project done on time that adds a, a great benefit to our city. So I appreciate you being here tonight. I wish you good luck. We'll be in communication uh, with, with everyone involved and with our residents um, as we move forward. Okay, we will move on now to item nine, a study session, uh, and we will receive a presentation on establishing a commercial linkage fee for new commercial developments in the city of San Carlos. Mr. Save. Good evening, honorable mayor, members of the city council. Crystal, can we have that presentation? Thank you. Um, San Carlos has been experiencing strong growth in the residential real estate market for quite some time now, as I'm sure you're aware, and the rapid price increases in the residential real estate market haven't been matched by similar increases in wages. And this has become a fairly significant issue in the city of San Carlos, and we know it is on the peninsula in our, in, in our region. One of the common things that are themes that we've heard from the businesses that we visited, particularly out in the east side of San Carlos, where you have larger businesses, manufacturing businesses, that it's very difficult for them to retain uh, skilled labor and to attract and retain those folks. Um, some leave for positions to find employment in areas where it's a less expensive rental market. And we've heard even from residents and, and folks in the area that work here that have gainful employment that um, the rapid increases are also sending them uh, out of our marketplace. Um, we already have a number of tools to help to create uh, workforce housing in our community. 
and the commercial linkage fee would be another tool for the city to use. And what it would do is it would require uh, certain businesses where they're adding new commercial square footage to our community to pay a fair share of the creation of local workforce housing for the benefit of creating those jobs and, and bringing that square footage to our community. Um, we had a very deep dive discussion with the city council housing subcommittee on this. We've had a number of meetings with them. And uh, after careful consideration of the research that's been done and discussing this with staff in great detail, the housing subcommittee instructed staff to move forward with the initial composition of a commercial linkage fee for your consideration this evening. And so this study session would focus on the details of how the commercial linkage fee would work and um, about why it might be a good tool for the city of San Carlos. Our economic development coordinator, Martin Romo, is going to walk you through the research that he's done and, and that the housing subcommittee has done and explain the uh, commercial linkage fee to you. And then um, he's got some things for the city council to consider as options, and then we'll be available to answer any questions. So I'm gonna turn it over to Martin. Good evening, uh, city council members. My name is Martin Remo, economic development coordinator. <clears throat> so as Al mentioned, um, we looked at this uh, topic of displacement and we began our research by looking at uh, displacement, anti-displacement strategies regionally. And so we noticed that Bay Area, Bay Area cities have begun to adopt a series of tools to protect the residents from displacement. And the city of San Carlos has adopted several tools in our municipal code with the same objective. We currently have condominium conversion regulations, which limit the number of annual conversions from apartments to condos, and which provide relocation assistance to tenants. The city also promotes transit-oriented development by permitting higher density projects near transit corridors. We provide incentivized land use controls through a city density bonus beyond that of what the state mandates. Uh, and this incentivizes production of below market rate units. And we have an affordable housing impact fee program uh, that charges a, f a fee to market rate residential development in order to mitigate uh, the impact of that market rate project on the need for affordable housing. But regionally, jurisdictions are adopting other tools to uh, enable their communities to mitigate these impacts. And these include things like community benefits agreements, rent stabilization ordinances, and just cause eviction clauses. And the tool that we believe would be most beneficial for the city at this time is the commercial linkage fee program. And as Al mentioned, these are programs that require developers to pay their fair share to mitigate the impact uh, of their projects onto the city. And as I mentioned, the city already has a development fee program for residential development, which begs the question of why we need an additional fee program for commercial development. Uh, if we look at this graph, we can see that since the year 2000, new development projects in San Mateo County as a whole um, were 85% commercial, and this rate for the city of San Carlos was 92%. So of all this new development that's been happening in the city, uh, only a very small fraction has been contributing towards mitigating these impacts on the housing market in the city. And this is very significant uh, because for every new commercial development that is completed, uh, there is a new demand for labor force housing and of which uh, some of those workers will require affordable housing which may not be read readily available. Um, in this slide, the blue bars illustrate average sectoral salaries for lower earning positions uh, that may be created as a result of new commercial projects. And the gold line uh, marks the annual salary required to afford a one bedroom unit in our area. In the middle of this chart, there is a blue bar that shows what the average sectoral salary is uh, for hotel and motel clerks. And we can see that uh, there is a $63,450 affordability gap um, from what uh, those employees would be earning per year and what it would cost to live in the area. And this is very important because the California Employment De Development Department projects that uh, this sector is likely to increase by 31% in our area by the year 2022. So, these nexus studies uh, 
what they do is they look at this uh, linkage between commercial square foot development and it quantifies uh, what the demand for affordable housing is. And so these studies are required by law whenever any linkage fee is adopted to determine this essential nexus and rough proportionality for a project and the fee. And the way that uh, the study is conducted is that it looks at um, a wide array of variables and sets a legally defensible maximum justified fee level for the fee program. And our particular fee study was composed by by, uh, or conducted by the uh, regional group 21 Elements that seeks to provide cities in San Mateo County with um, assistance for meeting their housing needs. So after a series of computations, a consultant conducting the study arrived at the maximum justifiable fee for the city of San Carlos, which was $152 for hotel uses, uh, $264 for retail, restaurant, and personal service uses, and $229 per square foot for office, medical office, and research and development space. So jurisdictions seldom adopt their fees at this maximum justifiable uh, level, and that's because financial feasibility of projects and local policies need to be considered for any such fee program. As such, the consultant uh, looked at uh, total development costs for different prototypical projects of each land use and tested fee levels to understand what amounts would not deter development by making it financially infeasible, uh, but would provide a significant amount to mitigate its impact on housing affordability. So the Nexus study uh, consultant recommended fee level uh, was $15 per square foot for hotel space, $5 per square foot for retail, restaurant, and personal service space, and $20 per square foot for office, medical office, and research and development space. So after uh, obtaining the results of these of the study and having it peer reviewed by our own consultant um, who found that the study was conducted with industry standard approaches and that the costs were legitimate and would not deter development, we uh, brought this back to the City Council Housing Subcommittee and staff determined that adjusting the next study recommended hotel fee downward from $15 to $10 per square foot uh, would keep the city more competitive in the marketplace as neighboring jurisdictions have adopted such a fee at closer to the $10 per square foot range. So if we look at this chart which outlines uh, what different jurisdictions are charging in their existing commercial linkage fee program, we can see that several cities, well, first we can see that a lot of cities uh, do currently have this program. And if we look at the far right column, there's the date adopted column. You'll note that uh, most cities have only very recently adopted uh, one of these programs, with the exception of Palo Alto, who's had one for, since 1984. And all of these fees are typically charged on a net new per square foot basis, meaning that a commercial building that is being redeveloped is only charged for the new square feet added to the project site. Additionally, only these stated land uses are charged for, um, are subject to the fee. Uh, that's hotel, retail restaurant, office R&D, and medical office. So therefore, projects redeveloping from a non-fee use, say a warehouse use, uh, to a fee use such as office would be subject to the total fee and vice versa. So an office project converting into warehouse would not be subject to the fee. By looking at the blue box, uh, we can see that the proposed fee amount for the city of San Carlos is comparable to uh, San Mateo County levels and other neighboring jurisdictions within uh, San Mateo County. So we take a little bit of a closer look at Palo Alto's program as it has the longest history to see how their, how their program has fared. And they were able to provide a significant amount of affordable housing units. Over 24 years of their program, Palo Alto was able to construct 377 new affordable housing units uh, for an average of about 15 units per year. And as a matter of fact, the city of Palo Alto is currently studying an update to their fees uh, where they are actually con contemplating potentially tripling their fee for the office space used to $60 per square foot. So what benefits can San Carlos expect from such a program? Since, the pro since this fee would be project-based, it's difficult to estimate what the exact revenue number would be. But if we consider the city's 2030 general plan estimated growth um, and employ the recommended fee levels, uh, it is projected that the fee could provide nearly $23.7 million in revenues, which translates roughly into about 75 affordable units uh, from the projected commercial linkage fee revenues. 
So cities do tailor their commercial linkage fee programs to best fit with the local community. Therefore, if the city council chooses to move forward with such a program, there are a few options that can be considered for, for adoption. Uh, one is whether the city would like to offer a fee exemption for particular uses, such as religious buildings, nonprofit space, or hospitals. Uh, the housing subcommittee and staff uh, recommend this exemption, uh, and that's for feasibility, for feasibility concerns. Uh, option two, whether there should be a fee, a fee exemption or reduction for buildings of less than a certain size. Staff and housing subcommittee recommend uh, this exemption be provided for buildings or projects of 5,000 square foot or less. And the Economic Development Advisory Committee, or EDAC, uh, recommends that this uh, be elevated to $10,000 per square foot or less. Uh, and just to give you a glimpse of what our neighbors are doing, uh, Menlo Park provides this exemption at 10,000 square feet. The County of San Mateo provides it at 3,500, and Redwood City at 5,000 or less. The third item for consideration would be whether the city wanted to provide a 25% fee reduction for projects that employ prevailing wage labor. Staff and housing subcommittee recommend that this reduction be adopted, and that is because uh, builders typically experience costs of about 25% to 30% higher than what, uh, than what builders would pay for non-prevailing wage. So this would be uh, basically a credit that would enable those prevailing wage uh, wages to be paid. Um, fourth, uh, I should say, EDAC did not recommend this reduction. Fourth, should developers be given an option to build housing units either on or off-site and or dedicate land instead of paying the linkage fee? So housing subcommittee did not uh, recommend this option be giving and EDAC recommended that this option be giving uh, and this is just as a, a policy consideration. So. We are currently uh, at this first bullet, just to give you an idea of where the process has been. This, uh, we received this study in July of 2016, and we've now arrived at this initial study session where we'll discuss whether uh, to continue with, uh, with this, considering this program and any of the additional options. And if, if we so choose to move forward, there can be a potential first reading of the first draft of the, of the ordinance on October 24th. And then again, if that's to move forward, a potential second reading on the November 14th Council meeting. So I know that I've gone over a lot of data, but I will be very happy to answer any questions that you may have. And I, additionally, I'd like to uh, recognize Josh Abrams of 21 Elements, who was the project manager for our commercial linkage fee nexus study, and uh, will be available to answer any technical questions of the report and, and or to provide any insight into the regional impacts of such a program. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Martin. Excellent presentation. Questions for staff? Uh, Matt? Oh, did you did you have any questions? Oh, I'm sorry, I had the light on. But you no, had your I, light on. I okay. have no questions. We'll come back questions. to you, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, nice presentation. Thank you. Um, just go through these one by one. Um, on slide seven, which is where you were showing the results of the study, and then the staff recommended linkage fees. Thank you. Um, is there a simple? Uh, layman's explanation for why the maximum justified linkage fees are so much, I, I know you talked about the, the negative commercial impact on development, but the process that generates the numbers, why does it end up generating numbers that are 10 times higher than what people typically charge? So I can speak uh, briefly on that and I can, I can invoke the assistance of our consultants as well. Um, generally the, you know, the, the fees, the way the computations work is that you look at the employment density for a particular use and these uses um, are high employment density uses. And so what it does is it looks at what that affordability app is for, for workers and it calculates a very high fee. So these just happen to be the actual numbers that it would take to complete completely fill that gap. And so uh, that's why there seem to be quite large numbers because it's oh, very- Oh, I see, I see. In other words, in part it's driven by, for example, that uh, these, uh, the first two hotel, retail, restaurant service, they tend to have large numbers of relatively low paid uh, employees. Right. And so you're looking at what it would take to bring them up to that affordability level. Right, which is, which is also why the, the levels vary for different types of uses. Right. Okay, thank you. That makes, that makes uh, perfect sense conceptually. Um, on page 10, or slide 10, 
um, where you, you made an estimate uh, based on the 2008-2030 general plan and showing just shy of, or just a little over $23.5 million. Um, do you know roughly how much of that, uh, since that's a period of 2008 to 2030, a number of years, eight years of that have already gone by? Um, and, and so do you have a sense of what's still potentially in the offing? So for the hotel, we, you know, we make some exclusions there for some of our bigger projects, you know, like Landmark Hotel and uh, Meridian 25. So we make that adjustment. That um, was taken out, basically. Yeah, that was taken okay. out to make sure that we didn't overinflate the right. number. But, you know, it's just a general kind of projection. Okay, no, but that's good. I, I, it wasn't clear to me that you had made those kind of adjustments. So that, that, that makes perfect sense. It makes it more likely that it, the 23.695 is still an estimate, but it's, it's a more reasonable estimate than if it just looked at the entire time frame. Um, on that same slide, um, uh, where that translates into building an, uh, an estimated 75 affordable units, does the analysis indicate roughly how many additional employees get brought in as a result of if the work that ge the construction that generates the fees you're showing up above gets done. In other words, uh, I, what I'm trying to get a handle on is um, if we are building, we're raising money and building 75 affordable units, but we're bringing in 5,000 new employees. That, that's a big mismatch, right? And I'm not saying we can necessarily cover it, but I'm trying to get a feel for what that relationship is. Did, did you look at anything like that? Um, I think I can defer to our consultant for that okay. part of the analysis. So you're right that it won't be a large percentage of the units of the the jobs covered. It'll be it'll be a small percent. Just the reality that you can't charge the full two hundred dollar per square foot fee. Maybe the best way to think about it is actually that if you're charging about a tenth of the fee, you could probably house a tenth of the people, though the number's going to be high, better because you can get some outside leverage, low-income housing tax credits. But we could, if, if we dug into the report, we could actually get the, the in the appendixes, there's the exact number of jobs created per hotel room and per retail square foot. So it is it is in there. Probably the best is just to look at the percentage of the max. Uh, th that makes perfect sense to me. It's obviously intuitive. And uh, if the report's available, Al, maybe I can stop in and take a look at it at some point, just satisfy my curiosity. Um, next page, on page 11, um, the options for consideration. Um, what was the thinking, how would you summarize the thinking about the notion of why exempt hospitals? Uh, exempting religious buildings and not-for-profits didn't affect, but I'm just like, why hospitals? Um, for example, because this includes uh, the office, uh, includes medical office buildings, and so some hospitals will have ancillary uses that provide medical office, and it could be, I could be argued either way that uh, there are big office, uh, medical office players or uh, hospital providers that may not necessarily need an exemption. You know, the, the, the theory behind the exemption is that it would make a project financially uh, infeasible potentially, right? And so the concern with nonprofit space is that it is office space, but it would be difficult to realize a new project, but it may not be as difficult for um, a big hospital uh, developer to realize the project. Yeah, that's that's echoes kind of some of my thinking as well. That coupled to the fact that everything I've read said that the, uh, the uh, graying of San Mateo County is going to continue you know, uh, to be very significant moving forward. And as populations age, that tends to create increased demand for medical care. And so there'll be more and more hospitals being built. And I'd hate to exempt something like that because they also tend to bring in a large number of relatively low paid um, uh, workers as well. Um, that's all the questions I had for now. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Ron? Uh, thank you, Cameron. Uh, yeah, just a few. Um, uh, first of all, a uh, great report, and uh, really enjoyed working with you. This has been sort of a long-term project that we've been, been working on, and I'm really glad to see it coming forward to the uh, council at this point. Um, what Mark uh, asked my first question was uh, all uh, it was about the justified uh, justifying those maximum fees, so I won't I won't go there. Um, on the pre the prevailing wage fee reduction, is that something that other cities do? And is, is there, I mean, how did you arrive at 25%, why not 30 or 20 or 
some so other number. Other cities do do it. Uh, our neighbor Redwood City provides that exemption for mm -hmm. projects that provide prevailing wage. And uh, builders have said that when you use prevailing wage, your total development cost increases by about 25 to 30 percent. And so the you know the driving theory behind this is that um, you see that as a benefit to the community and to uh, those employees, and that you um, you offer this as a credit for their development costs. All right. So, you, so uh, it sounds like from your answer that you you did uh, talk to labor about, you know, what that number ought to be. Yeah, that's what we okay. can tell that the costs. All right. Are. Um, the next one was, um, what would be the impact of um, th that whole business of the five thousand and ten thousand square foot buildings and exempting them from the fee? What sort of impact is that? Uh, would would you have or would it have on on the revenue that we would collect would would there if we let's say we exempted 10,000 square feet would there be a rush to build a lot of 9500 square foot uh, commercial businesses thereby you know sort of uh, you know uh, denying us the, the collection of fees or does that not work in their economic model I think that's a very good question. So I should mention that some communities do not grant exemptions to buildings of any size, and they just charge all development that falls within that category. Um, I think that this particular option comes down to a policy consideration as to what uh, could potentially happen within our community um, and what uh, typical floor plates are within the city and uh, how what kind of change is projected and... and Likely to occur. I mean, not that I want to charge onerous fees, and, and it sounds like people who are thinking of constructing five or something like, you know, 9,500 square foot, 10,000 square foot buildings, uh, that might be a game changer, I would think, uh, for them if, if their finances are limited. I'm not necessarily against the exemption. I, I want to hear what my colleagues have to say about that. But I was just wondering about what you thought the impact might be. Um, and then... Um, the, the other, it's, this is sort of a general question, um, a sort and in terms of um, the feedback you've got from other cities uh, from their imposition of linkage fees, uh, has, has there been a, has it had any effect at all on new projects coming into the city? And I do know that from your chart, a lot of us, a lot of the cities in San Mateo County are doing it, and I guess does that sort of make the argument that if it's happening in virtually every city, the impact is going to be negligible? So that's a really good question. I'm going to uh, let uh, Josh address that as he represents 21 elements and they've assisted other communities uh, adopt their programs and so he can speak to what's occurred over the last couple of years. All right. And then I have, I'll have one more for you and then I'll be done. So generally, if it, the market's strong, the, there's been no there's been no concerns because when the when the developments were planned, when the pro formas were done, their rent assumptions were more moderate than what they are what they're actually going to get. So I haven't heard from any cities objections to the fees, and I haven't even really heard from any of the building industries concerns because most of none of the cities Palo Alto is, is an exception, but none of the cities have been proposing really fifty or hundred dollar fees, and then I think that really would. But the fifteen twenty dollar fees that we see a lot of cities doing, um, that's that hasn't we haven't seen any effect. Okay. Um, so the last question does have to do with Palo Alto, and I, I don't know which one of you wants to answer it. Maybe Martin. Um, do you know why Palo Alto, after 32 years, is increasing their fees? Is it to slow down construction? <laughs> because they've been pretty active. So I think that uh, I think Palo Alto has been experiencing a lot of office development and. Uh, you know, the fee really, the objective of the fee is really to mitigate the impacts of a lot of development. So I think that, uh, you know, it is the maximum justifiable fee and any city could uh, that could support and still attract development um, could potentially charge that fee. And it seems that Palo Alto has arrived at a place where um, they are able to have that conversation of actually charging that maximum justifiable fee. So right. I, I know there's been a lot in the news about it, a lot of angry people who think that it's being overbuilt and that sort of thing. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thanks, Ron. Matt? You gave a statistic on here um, about the 2030 general plan estimated commercial growth at 3 million, there it is, yeah, 3 million 437, 200 square feet. Uh, since we're talking about housing, 
what's the general plan estimated growth from that time period on housing? I'll yield to uh, Director Seve to address that. You know, I don't uh, have the exact number, but I can tell you that in the general plan, the population um, maximum at the year 2030 would be about 34,000, a little over 34,000. Today, we're at 29,000 people. So earlier, Mark asked about, um, you know, is there a way to estimate people increased workers based on these square footages. And he deferred to the consultant. And I didn't hear anybody say that there is. And I'm confused because if I go into the building code we're going to be looking at later, it says, you know, there's charts in there that say if you're going to build office, office has a load capacity of this. If you're going to build in, uh, you know, uh, industrial manufacturing has a load capacity of this. Seems to me somebody could figure that out so that you would know, uh, at least have some good idea of if you build this much commercial in these kind of categories, you can expect to have an increased population of workforce in your town of this. Has anybody done that? Doesn't this guy be Actually, um, I, do, I do have a number for that. Um, in our general plan, it says that we would create approximately 9,000 new jobs from the time we adopted 2009 to the year 2030. Okay, so then if we could do that, if we can figure out that we're going to have 9,000 new jobs, couldn't we also give some kind of guesstimate to uh, those 9,000 jobs? So that's 9,000 people, but people don't live alone, generally. So you could figure out, okay, that means we need this many more households if we're going to increase our work capacity in the town by 9,000 jobs. Can't we do that? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. You want to? I, 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 perhaps I wasn't clear. We, we have that. It's in the report. Uh, after the meeting, I can, I, I don't know the number here. I could look it up. It might take me five minutes to find it. But um, we can send an email afterwards clarifying the number for each, each prototype. Because there's a couple of steps involved in the report does them all. But you start with the total number of jobs. And then you discard all the employees that are making wage is high enough that they can get housing. So you just start looking at the moderate and low income people. Hold on, hold on. I, over here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, you, you can do that, but that's not what I'm driving at. What I'm driving at is, you know, for me, and, and this is a bit of commentary, I'm not asking you a question, but you're the one that provided the report and it's our staff that's looking at this, I, I guess at the behest of some of our council members. But it seems to me that uh, what we really should be looking for is to make sure that we zone property in such a way that we can allow for the development so that we have, if we're going to do this much commercial, we make sure that we have this much of residential potential. And then we back away and stay away from it because allow the developers. We've got, we just tonight, we had a developer here, you know, it's going to build housing on a parking lot of ours. As, as long as we're doing our part, it seems to me that we don't have to look at these fees and collecting money because really all you're doing is creating a lottery. You just said right here, you, somewhere you showed, oh, we're gonna build, what was it, 37 units in a certain time period? 75. Yeah, 75. That to me, that's, that's not doing nothing more than creating a lottery because that 75 is not gonna meet the need. What's gonna meet the need is the market. Okay, thank you, Matt. Um, Mark, you had an additional question? Yes, it did, Mr. Mayor. Um, it um, relates to the proposed or optional 25% uh, fee reduction for prevailing wage uh, projects. Um, the question I have is, is there a way, and does any other agency perhaps structure their fee schedule such that that reduction is a function of 
the current economic environment. Here's what I mean by that. Um, uh, the comment that prevailing wage always increases the cost of the labor component of construction, uh, from everything I've read, actually, that depends totally on the, the economic environment. Uh, when, when business is booming and, and there's lots of construction work and basically everybody who can possibly swing a hammer is being employed, the gap between prevailing, the prevailing wage rate and the, the, what would you call it, the non-prevailing wage rate is minuscule if in fact, even if even there at all. And so there's a part of me that every time we talk about creating these incentives, um, I don't mind giving an incentive to achieve a public policy goal when there's a reason to, but there's not always a reason to. Like right now, the current economic environment is such that I think I don't think there is much of a difference between prevailing wage and non-prevailing wage. Does anybody do anything like that, where they structure the, the subsidy differently? To my understanding, I don't, I don't know, but I will do. It's, it's a, the art of balancing complexity or simplicity with perfectly capturing the market. It's less common, the, this prevailing wage um, reduction is, is a relatively new trend, and I don't think any cities have done, have done that type of, of fine tuning that you talked about. Um, generally, cities will sometimes, if the market goes down, relook at the fees comprehensively mm -hmm. and change them, but probably not so much at the, like, the micro level or plan ahead at that micro level. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Ron? Uh, thanks, Cameron. Uh, Martin, just, and, and maybe this is for you, Josh. I, you know, in the report, it, you talk, it talks about San Carlos could support construction of an estimated 75 uh, affordable units. Is there a connection to market rate units that uh, if we're, you know, if we're going to build, if all of this commercial development is realized over the next 15 years or so, is there any connection to how many market rate units we can expect to also be built? Or is there just no correlation at all because we're ta only talking about affordable units? In this particular fee program, it only takes into account and makes projections for the commercial side. Um, so ostensibly that that analysis would have been done for the residential right. fee linkage program okay. that was done. That's kind of what I thought. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Robin. Bob? Uh, I just wanted to make a comment um, to my colleague. Um, I know intuitively that would make sense of what you said, Mr. Olbert, about the, the, the dollars being, you know, the wages would be up. But in my experience in, in business, and we had up and down times, uh, it, didn't, it doesn't exist. There's always going to be a, uh, an, an, and I don't know whether it's 25 all the time, but it does go up. There's, a prevailing wage costs more than, than not. Even today, you could walk out the door and go to some of these housing projects and ask what they're paying for a carpenter or a laborer or whatever, and the, the actual wage for a prevailing wage is going to be higher. At least that's my experience. So I know but intuitively, I, I know where you're coming from, but I don't think, there, I don't think the actual market shows that. So. We, we should talk about that offline. Okay, but I just, okay, I just, I just wanted to, Again, uh, so I, I just had a couple questions. Um, I, I'm more interested um, on the, you know, the expenditure side. Okay, so you know, we raise a bunch of housing funds. Um, can you give us just a little bit of information about how, what what are the restrictions about how this money can be spent? So it goes into our housing fund. Is that correct? That's correct. And so therefore, it can be spent on building housing, acquiring property, et cetera. Yes, it can be, uh, this will go into a fund that allows us to spend it on moderate income, low income, extremely low income projects. So any affordable housing that the city chooses to either subsidize or develop, will be able to support it with these monies. Okay, but not market rate housing? Uh, no. And so moderate income, that's still, you know, it's still, it's still an expensive home or an expensive apartment. And then do you, what's the current balance in our housing fund? I believe. Seven million. Twelve million, seven million. Seven. Which one is it? I think uh, I'll defer. <laughs> it's about it's about ten, and about 10. we're going to have about twelve after Wheeler Plaza well, pays there. You said not too yeah, long ago yeah. it was seven, and we were going to lose it. So. Well, so then I wanted to ask to that point, Matt. My understanding is that there is a, a time limit or an expiration on some of our housing funds. Um, is that the case? Would the revenue that comes from this program also have a time limit on it? Could it be held in the bank indefinitely? 
Um, the question of whether, whether or not in, these impact fees are subject to the Mitigation Fee Act is hasn't been settled. The, uh, the conservative thing to do would be to treat them like they are so you don't run into problems. The, my understanding of the Mitigation Fee Act, and we might want to consult counsel, is that um, there's two reports that have to happen, an annual report and in a three-year report. If that three-year report doesn't happen, those fees could be lost. But if the three-year report has certain findings that there's not enough money to accomplish the goals, you can continue, you can hold the money over. But we might want to have counsel weigh in. Well, I mean, just to summarize, what I'm asking is money collected today needs to be spent by three years, is that? I think that's the general rule, but uh, I would have to look in the details of how the how the mechanism works for okay. you. So I, I think the broader question, and I, I will say just at the outset that I, I'm, I'm supportive of the idea, but my question is, if we have $10 million in the bank, which we haven't spent, and some uh, concern about it expiring, uh, and we're proposing, hey, let's collect a new fee to continue to grow that pot of money, does the staff have a vision or identified projects that they want to use that money for? Yes, um, currently we um, are looking at 50 new affordable housing units in the next couple of years, and one project would be 817 Walnut, which is next to the Bianchini's um, uh, parking area, and that uh, is currently six units, and we're looking at 20. So. Uh, you're looking at an increase there. And then we're, we would like to do one on Cherry Street. Uh, and we're thinking 30 units at Cherry Street uh, in cooperation with Hip Housing, who owns the property. And we anticipate that if, if we do both of those development, all 50 units, we would exhaust our BMR funds. So that's another thing is that it would, it would reload your ability to create additional housing you know, after these two projects are completed or underway. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, Matt, did you have a question? or Just a comment. The, the seven million may have come from that's the portion that's at risk mm. okay. because of the, the timing and when you acquired the money. But okay. uh, great. Thanks for the clarification. Um, Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just want to um, mention again, as I did the last time, we, we talked about uh, the potential expiration of affordable housing funds. Um, to some extent, that's a, a bit of a false concern uh, because um, there tends to be a hidden assumption that we only spend the money on projects that are in San Carlos. And the reality is if we found a project anywhere, presumably in any one of the neighboring communities that was an affordable housing project, there is a vehicle, a mechanism for us to be able to take that money, as I understand it from the earlier discussion, and apply it to those projects. And the odds on there not being any projects around anywhere nearby that we would not be able to spend money on. I'm not worried about the money expiring, going, oh my gosh, we, we ran out of places to spend it. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, any further comments or should we take some public comment? All right, um, uh, now is the time for public comment. I have three speaker cards. Our first speaker tonight is Victor Toronto. Good evening. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Council members, and staff. I'm representing the San Mateo Building Constru Construction Trades Council and are in support of the two-tiered impact fee. Generally, any added cost to construction negatively trickles down to workers building the project. Having said that, we do understand the critical need for additional affordable housing in San Mateo County. We understand that there are no answers to resolve, the, no one answer to resolve this problem. Therefore, we support the proposal for the two-tiered impact fee before you this evening. This two-tiered impact fee will reward developers who recognize the importance of paying construction workers wages that enable them to live and work in a, our community of San Carlos. This, Additionally, we recommend that all revenue generated by this impact fee be used to actually construct affordable housing. By using the revenue for construction of new affordable units, San Carlos will be helping to alleviate displacement of existing residents and enabling new residents that would otherwise not afford to live in San Carlos. 
Finally, by adding to the affordable housing stock, these new residents will no longer commute long distances to work and thereby reducing their contribution to house, uh, greenhouse gases and at the same time improving their quality of life with their families. Um, also, I'd just like to add, um, typically, um, there is a huge differential in that sector of the industry of housing between the prevailing wage and um, uh, non-prevailing wage workers uh, due to the fact that a lot of times they are um, undocumented immigrants, they're working in the underground economy, so there are some huge displacements in wage. They are unrepresented workers. Thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. Thank you. Thanks for the comments. Our next speaker is Leora Tanwatko. Good evening. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Councilman. Thank you for your time this evening. My name is Leora Tonwatko. I am um, with the Housing Leadership Council, and we encourage you to adopt the commercial linkage fee. Um, it's my job to track these fees throughout the county, and I wanted to add to the lovely presentation that the city of San Mateo adopted these fees last month, actually. Um, and I really appreciate your attention to the jobs, housing, and balance. You guys really understand the problem and have hit the nail on the head as to what's going on, why traffic is so bad, why you can't get across the San Mateo Bridge um, you know, after 4 p.m. Um, because San Mateo County really has created a lot of jobs and not very much housing. And so you have the situation where people who work here can't afford to live here. And the commercial linkage fee does a little bit to rectify this problem. I understand, though, that it is 75 units are just a drop in the bucket for all of the, the units and all of the need for affordable housing. And you're right, it does create a lottery, and that is the system we have. But I also like to think that I won the lottery, too, because I was born to people who own property in this county. And, you know, I was able to live at home when I had an unpaid internship, and I could take advantage of all the jobs here without paying rent. And so, for these 75 families, it's yes, it's a lottery, but you know, I would love to extend the opportunity that I have to, to 75 other families. So please adopt these fees. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is David Crabb. Good evening, David. Honorable Mayor and members of the council. Uh, I'm here to support the the concept of a uh, an impact fee or, or a connection fee. Um, it, uh, there was some uh, discussion going on. Uh, I think I heard um, the projection is for 9,000 jobs coming up in I don't know how many years uh, overall. And you try to figure the number of housing units that's involved. Uh, the, the rule of thumb is 1.5 uh, housing units, uh, jobs per housing unit. So you take that 9,000, divide it by that number, you got 6,000 units of housing is needed. That's market rate and affordable. Uh, we're not even close to that, even in our pipeline. We don't even come and have 1,000 in the pipeline right now. So we definitely need housing, and we definitely need affordable housing. And uh, part of that is because we've been pushing for hotels, and hotels are the lowest paying uh, corporations there are in terms of uh, what the needs for people uh, and the ratios in hotels according to the report that actually is part of this is uh, 0.75 jobs uh, three quarters of a job for every room in a hotel so take your hotel and you know, multiply it out you'll see how many low income jobs most of those are maids janitors uh, kitchen staff, maybe a couple of managers can afford to live here. So it's really important to build on uh, more housing or to slow down your, your, uh, your commercial construction. You've got to do one or the other to get a balance. And uh, uh, Matt, I apologize, but uh, we, the market's not going to do it. The market is not going to be building affordable housing. The market is going Let's to be... Not direct your comments to one council member. You're talking to the whole council. Right. And if you want to have an offline construct, a discussion about free market capitalism, you're welcome to do so with me at coffee or something like that. But don't pick me out. Thank you very much. Okay, <laughs> okay so bottom line, uh, you need the balance uh, and you've got to do it either by slowing down your commercial development or building more housing to do it. 
the, this linkage fee is a step in the right direction. It's not even close to where it needs to be, but it's something. This is a lot lower than the fee that you're charging on uh, residential. Your residential fees are quite high and actually quite good. Uh, and this in relationship to that is, is, is peanuts, but this is better than nothing, so please approve it. All right, thank you, David. Appreciate the comments. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Okay, well, I wanna um, start actually by thanking the subcommittee, Bob and Ron, for um, going deep on this issue and uh, taking the time to think about it and to weigh the various trade-offs. Um, you know, we don't have a specific uh, resolution tonight, but w we have to give staff um, guidance as to how we wanna proceed. I, I thought we might start with the subcommittee and then maybe we can start from there. So I don't know if either of you two gentlemen wanna summarize kind of where you where you landed. Well, yeah, we, we talked about the different items and, and it's been on page 11, I guess. It shows what the, if you could put the 11 up, that would be great so everybody could see it. Um, what we came up with, I think uh, we talked about the different items, the, the square footage, um, the 25%. Um, uh, we want to have them uh, build uh, the housing units, but uh, and not pay the linkage. You know, we we could have them pay the link. If 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 we could, if we had the land in town, I'd I'd be happy to have them be able to build the houses. But we don't have the land that I see. I mean, there's not much of it. So we're going to have to go out and buy it, unfortunately. And uh, at least the way I see it. So that's why we came up with number four. So I mean, I I concur with all of the four items that we came up with uh, on the committee. I realize EDAC had a different opinion on, on uh, three and four, but uh, I, I feel that we should uh, have the ones that uh, our committee and staff also came up with. All right, thanks. Ron, anything you wanna add? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Cameron. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Bob. Um, I'm very happy that this is uh, uh, this study has gotten to the council here and that we're having this discussion. I think it's very important. important. I really believe we have a moral imperative to do this. If we don't uh, uh, find ways to build more housing, more affordable housing, we just become a wealthy retirement community. And that's the big, you know, if I, people want to live in a wealthy retirement community, there's places like Lincoln and, you know, Rancho Marietta and that sort of thing. But you know, San Carlos uh, really can't afford uh, economically uh, to become that way. So. Um, I really think that you know we need to uh, uh, pursue this. And the other thing I want to add is that uh, you know if we have this extra money um, and we don't have the projects maybe inside our city limits to do it, as uh, uh, Council Member Olbert pointed out, there are other neighboring cities that uh, we could uh, help out through uh, organizations like HART, which is uh, specifically set up for this purpose. I I'm hoping that at some point we can uh, we can allocate some of the linkage fees directly to HART for the purpose of building more housing. Um, and also in our town, one of the things that we could do. Uh, uh, Mr. Seve pointed out is uh, uh, we're going to be building hopefully some 30 new units of affordable housing with HIP housing. We can use the money we have and leverage it with other organ affordable housing organizations to build more than just those 75 units. So I think that 75 unit number is a little bit misleading. People tend to focus on just that tiny little number. It's the opportunity to build that housing that comes with it in the synergy with other cities and other organizations that will get us to building a critical number of more affordable unit housing. And also, um, I, I am happy that um, we are also pursuing just more market rate housing in general. Um, I, I don't think we can ignore either one. So thank you. All right. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Mark, you want to weigh in here? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, and thank you, Ron and Bob, for, for your comments. Uh, first off, I want to clarify something that I think some people in the audience may have misunderstood. Um, my questions earlier about the discussion involving prevailing wage is not at all because I don't support prevailing wages. In fact, uh, I'm one of the council members who has tended to fight pretty hard to make sure that we incorporate that. Uh, it really has nothing to do with the wage size, side of things. What it is is I don't like writing checks to people if I don't need to, um, but I want to see people well paid. Um, and, and so that's, that was the sum totality of the basis of that discussion. Um, you know, uh, uh, in general, I support uh, everything that's, that's outlined here. Um, as you can probably guess from the questions, one of the questions I asked, personally, uh, I would not exempt hospitals. 
at least not as a blanket thing. Um, and I say that just because I, I think that's going to be a significant growth industry throughout the peninsula. Um, and uh, uh, because of their, their mix of uh, employees that they, they tend to have, they tend to draw in folks who need housing. Um, so I would uh, personally like to see us not exempt hospitals. But um, that's, a, that's a relatively minor thing. Personally, I also would lean towards going higher on the fees um, than, than what's there, but I'm not going to quibble about that either because this is a start, and it's a decent start, and you got to start someplace. Um, the, uh, uh, we do have to do more, I think, as, as uh, Ron was saying, and I hope we will do more. I hope we won't just take a step here, enact something, and then say, okay, we're done. Uh, because this is uh, just a very small step that we can take to try and improve the housing situation uh, in San Carlos and help contribute to improving the housing situation in the peninsula, which is getting very dire. Um, there are other things that we can and should think about doing. Uh, they require more discussion and more time uh, in terms of encouraging construction of residential uh, capacity, but I hope we will continue to stay focused on that. And the last comment I want to make kind of related to all of that is there is a tendency for folks um, on occasion to look at uh, market dynamics and market forces as a magic bullet, a magic wand. Uh, markets, as anybody who has studied them, uh, and I've studied them intensively because uh, of, of my educational background, markets are not magic. They are a very powerful tool for accomplishing certain things, namely for delivering a product at the lowest possible cost. Um, but they are not perfect. And in fact, a big part of what government ends up being forced to do is to step in and try and fix things when markets don't work quite the way um, they need to. And I would submit that uh, in fact, the housing situation in the peninsula is a beautiful case in point of that. There have been market forces operating here for a really long time, and yet we are in a very dire situation. The only other one I know that's even remotely like this took place shortly after World War II when there was a flood of veterans coming back in from overseas, and there was literally nowhere near enough housing for all the extra couple of million people who showed up and decided they wanted to live in California. Um, so we do what we can. Uh, we let the market operate as well as it can because it is a very powerful force, but it is a tool, not a magic wand. Thank you, Mark. Um, I will say that um, I'm happy to take the uh, subcommittee's recommendation um, and appreciate you guys working on this. Um, I think Ron said it well. Um, this is really, for us in San Carlos, a question of whether or not we want to be continue to be uh, an inclusive community that is representative of um, all income spectrum uh, versus a sense of exclusivity. And I think that um, there is, to my mind, no more challenging issue for our community and for the peninsula than housing. Um, it's, it's a very, very tricky political issue. I don't think that we're making near enough progress. Um, but. You know, we all have an interest in maintaining um, the type of community that drew many of our families to want to live here in the first place. And so um, I'm happy that we're taking this step today, and I, I hope it leads to um, in, at least pushing in the right direction in terms of the, the cost of housing for a lot of people, be they teachers or firefighters, police officers, people who um, cut hair, people who, uh, you know, wait tables. Um, just because uh, they have those jobs and not jobs in super high income brackets doesn't mean they have no less of a place in our community. And uh, I hope that we can do this and do more to help um, uh, fix that jobs um, housing imbalance. So uh, where's Mr. Save? No, oh, there's Martin. Oh, no, I, I don't actually have a question. I just wanted to see if you're there. So you, you guys have your, your direction. Yes, Mark. I, I just, solely for the sake of, of completeness, I just wanted to see, is there anybody else who shares my interest in not exempting hospitals in terms of giving guidance to staff on what they're going to bring back? Um, normally, I would agree with you, but, and, and this is a you know particular sort of selfish interest on my part, being in the health insurance business, um, if... Hospitals have to pay more to build their hospitals. They're going to increase their fees more, which is going to raise insurance rates, which are already obscenely high. Um, if there was a way that we could uh, balance it with, you know, maybe a lower particular fee for them, I just don't want to encourage Im imposing even additional fees on the healthcare industry, which is already impacted severely. So that's 
that's my contribution to the argument. Just for the record, we haven't built the hospital that we approved <laughs> 10 years ago yeah, when Matt and I were on the council um, for PAMF, um, and I don't think there are going to be too many more, uh, but there could be, but I think we should just leave it the way it is. I don't think we're going to have put run into that, uh, that issue, but I could be wrong. Um, through, I've been wrong before. Through the chair, if I might ask, Steph, is, is, would that fall under a previously approved project? Right. It's already approved. So it, yeah. even yeah. if we did have the... Yeah. A fee for hospitals, they would be exempt, exempt from. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's not, I don't think it's going to happen. It, it might be a move point. Okay. Right. Mr. Rubens, you wanted to. I just had a comments? couple, a couple of points just to make sure the council. And it seems like the last discussion um, uh, showed you are aware. But just for the record, that the next step is to bring an ordinance to you, um, and with your input, we um, staff and I will work on uh, preparing that ordinance. And I did look um, up the Mitigation Fee Act issue um, while, while um, you were discussing that, and just um, since it was a question before, um, the city uh, every five years needs to review the, the funds that, that we have, um, and if there's insufficient, insufficient funds to um, build what we've uh, planned on building or identified in the plan, uh, then we can just adopt another five-year review. Um, but once the f sufficient funds are raised th to fund the project identified in the plan, um, this, the council has to set um, within 180 days a date that the project's going to be completed. And that's the end of the line if, if you don't build it within that 180 days. That's when the mitigation fees could possibly be refunded. All right, excellent, thank you. Okay, so you have your direction. We will, yes, sir. Chair, um, noticing that item number four, all these other ones have staff and you know some recommendation from staff one way or the other. Item four does not. And uh, if the rest of the council or if enough of the council members would like to have something in the next step from staff that would give their recommendation. For me, I'd be interested to know uh, what they feel about it and have it in that report. Because I, I think, you know, what we're doing tonight, this is a study session. So we will get something the next time. And uh, sure. we may want something in there or may not want something in there, but we don't have right now something as any uh, research or opinion from staff in writing. So. Okay. Al, you want to address that in the staff report, or you can either share comments now or you can include it in the staff report when it comes back. Yes, uh, Mayor and Council, we took more of a neutral position on this, although we, um, def we would defer to the housing subcommittee. Um, I think I would agree that you know, we're, we're just not going to see developers do this. They're not going to want to build, an uh, office developer isn't going to build. Uh, housing off-site. It's going to be too expensive for them for their pro forma just to build what they're trying to build. So um, we just took more of a neutral position. But I would say that if you're asking for a staff recommendation, we would go with the, the housing subcommittee for those reasons. One of the reasons I ask it, Al, is because we have, uh, it seems to me anyways, you correct me if I'm wrong, but when we did the general plan, uh, we allowed for mixed use in the downtown core. And the mixed use doesn't mean you have to do mixed use, it means you can do mixed use. So a developer could choose to do a project with say, you know, retail or office on the ground floor and housing above. It seems to me that's what's being built, going to be built right next door to where I live. Um, but on the other hand, the developer could have said, I'm not going to do housing at all. I'm just going to build an office building. Is that correct or am I wrong? In some cases, that may be possible. I need to go back and kind of look at the ordinance. Um, so maybe what you could do yeah. is look at the ordinance and look at that and maybe back up a little bit on the, on the statement that they're just not going to do that. Because if we have it zoned in such a way that they do have that choice, we may want to offer it to them. It's, it seems to me it's, it doesn't hurt to offer it. It only hurts not to offer it at all. 
So I think the, um, if I may add, um, there's a, a distinction between, and, and we talked about this and, and um, EDAC did too, there's a distinction between sort of the, the fine grain development that happens in and around the downtown and the Laurel Street and El Camino Corridor. And what we were talking about with the committee is the big developments like Windy Hill, uh, like um, the Landmark Hotel, where that's the kind of development where you're talking about hundreds of thousands of square feet of, of development. And are those guys going to go, okay, to meet our, um, instead of paying our fee, we're going to build housing on the other side of the tracks. See, that's what we, that's the main concern is that that will not occur. Um, you're right that um, there's a mix of things that can happen on a much smaller scale in the downtown. That's the reason for that exemption of lo smaller square footages. And that number two is that there was a recognition that you have smaller parcels in and around the downtown. And if you want to encourage that more office, which we don't have much of, you need to exempt some of that. So those are the two differences. However, I'm, just, I'm sorry to beat this horse, but I will. Um, you have, we, we've got one developer in town uh, that's doing a project on Walnut Street. And he's an active guy. And I could see him doing, right now he's doing a, a mixed use, I think it's mixed use uh, project on Walnut. If it's not mixed use, it's, it's probably uh, all parking garage and then housing above it. But he's an active guy and he's gonna do other projects in town. So potentially he could do another project in, the t in town uh, in the mixed use area or where he can do uh, 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 medium density or high density housing, and at the same time, couple that with a project that he may want to do on Industrial Road. Again, I, I repeat myself in saying, why not give the opportunity as opposed to just shut the barn door altogether? It seems to me we should leave that barn door open. So, uh, so through the chair. Oh. I, I, do, do, what I was going to suggest, since, since essentially this is a study session, we have a recommendation from the um, subcommittee, we have four council members who support that recommendation, is that when we bring it back as an ordinance, that we ask Al to put some more thought into addressing the specific item that you had. That's exactly and, what I'm asking yeah, for. Yeah, and I think we can do that, and then when we can come back, we can see if there's support on the council for it. Okay. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that's okay. exactly what I was looking for. Um, Mark, did you want to add anything? Uh, yes, because I was would like to make the argument to not do that. Um, for the simple reason that um, uh, my understanding anyway, and Greg, correct me if I'm wrong, these rules are not like uh, such that we never talk to developers um, to make changes. I mean, I, I, I mean the, the Windy Hill project, there are some other projects that are potentially coming forward where people are asking us for exemptions on the existing rules. And uh, um, we grant them or not, depending upon what the, what the facts and circumstances are. So to me, this is really all just about what sets the best stage for that negotiating process. And I would argue uh, providing less flexibility, at least a little bit, is actually paradoxically better in that point of view. It's not going to drive somebody away. It's just going to say they'll come back and say, well, you know, I really want to build the homes here in this case. And we'll say, well, OK, here's what you have to do. Right. So the, I, the ordinance that's drafted and the recommendation that's going to come from staff is going to be exactly as you said. OK. So we're just saying that we can discuss it at the next meeting. I thought I heard you say that you were going to ask staff to bring something I was going to ask staff in their staff report to talk about the pros and cons of the item that Matt brought up so that we're more well informed for that discussion. OK. OK. Any other comments? OK. We will now move on to new business, item 10, 10A. Uh, an ordinance that's going to amend various sections of the fire code and the technical building codes. And our presentation tonight will be from Mr. Al Save on a roll. Yeah. Not setting him up, knocking him down. <laughs> Mayor and City Council, uh, tonight, uh, well, about every three years, the state uh, makes adjustments to the building code and fire code. And so tonight, um, we're bringing forth the uh, adjustments to you for your consideration. And without further ado, I'm, I'm going to introduce Chris Valley, our building official, to talk about those changes. Thank you, Al. Uh, good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of Council. 
Uh, it's with great joy that I announced the uh, 2016 uh, California Building Codes have been released, and they become effective January 1st, 2017. Um, just a brief background. Uh, the, co the building codes are updated every three years, as Al mentioned, and are developed through a comprehensive multi-state agency <clears throat> and stakeholder effort, including the Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, Division of State Architect, Office of the State Fire Marshal, uh, California Energy Commission, industry stakeholders, and members of the public. Uh, at the local level, uh, the uh, International Code Council uh, Peninsula, East Bay, and Monterey Bay chapters have provided input on the code adoption process, <clears throat> which includes local building officials. Local jurisdictions may amend the uh, California Building Code before they go into effect. Uh, the San Carlos amendments are minimal and are consistent with neighboring um, cities. Uh, the fire marshal and I have worked toward a, what we call a practical enforcement of the building code that will not uh, in, impose unreasonable hardship to our uh, stakeholders. Uh, just some brief notable changes to mention. Um, the energy code as of January will be, uh, becomes 28% more stringent than previous standards. <clears throat> what this will result in is uh, a change in framed assemblies, walls in other words, insulation values increase to uh, R15 with an R8 barrier, so to speak. So the R, I'm sorry, the two by four wall pretty much sunsets. We'll be seeing a lot of two by six construction for single story and double and uh, two story structures. Uh, the construction and demolition debris diversion increases to 65%. Uh, HERS home energy rating system, uh, duct leakage uh, becomes more stringent. And then um, there'll be numerous lighting changes as well. So to keep people from leaving their lights on in their offices and homes and so forth. Uh, wood stoves and pellet stoves meet new EPA, uh, new source performance <clears throat> standards. Uh, the second bullet point is really key. Uh, the California Energy Commission, the steamroller at the state level, will continue to develop and adopt mandatory standards uh, between now and 2020. Um, and just a reminder, 2020 is the zero net um, energy goal for residential. Um, next year, this is somewhat of a sidebar item, but uh, electrical vehicle permit streamlining will be brought to, uh, the ordinance will be brought to council. We're actually already doing that um, with our current permitting process. We can get them online and um, Actually, our current process, I think, is less restrictive than what the state will be requiring in 2017. Um, future changes that are coming down the chute, so to speak, um, we'll probably be seeing increased insulation requirements for uh, ceiling and attic areas. Plumbing fixture maximum flow rates may decrease. What they're discovering is you do need a certain amount of water to keep the uh, drainage pipe clean. Um, so that's still under debate. Um, I believe we'll see more stringent uh, HERS rating criteria. And then um, I think that later on down the road, we're gonna see mandatory uh, special inspection for energy and other green building requirements. And I, as promised, kept this under five minutes. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Questions for staff, Mark? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chris. Um, the very last item was the one that I had a question about. Um, I just want to make sure I understand it. You may remember when I was working with you and we were building uh, our, our new home, um, the challenges we faced getting somebody to uh, sign off on the one element of the green energy thing. Right. Okay. Yeah, I do remember. Does that have anything to do with what you're talking about here? Or is that a totally different thing? It's a different thing, actually. Uh, it's, it involves a, a HERS raider, and they're in a, there's a there's an abundance of HERS raters okay. uh, because that's the key. It's a key element in the uh, energy code right now. Got it. Uh, we uh, HERS raters required for furnace replacements, AC installation, new duct, and so forth. So they're they're out there, and there there isn't the the issue that uh, you mentioned previously. Okay, and just for the, my colleagues' benefit, the point I was making was that I was in a, uh, Chris helped me out a lot, but I was in a catch-22 situation that I'd like to avoid putting anybody else in where I needed to have an inspection done and there was no inspector to do it. Not, not a city inspector, it was somebody I had to hire, but there just was no, right. nobody in the market to provide it. But it sounds like that's not what's here, so good. Yeah, I, I don't see that as an issue. Okay, all right, thanks Mark. Uh, Matt? 
question um, less to do with, well, one of them has to do with what we're doing, but the other one is kind of looking into the future. Um, you mentioned there's numerous lighting changes. Yeah, and I, I don't have specifics on all of them. But yeah, I wouldn't expect you to, <laughs> but um, the, the question I have is dealing with the, the Title 24 reports that are done and uh, the even the green building sheets that have to be done. And, and you have to do these things for, for lighting, uh, provide tables and calculations and so forth. And it seems to me that the code enforcement on that is not keeping up with what the market's doing because the market is creating so many fixtures, just like the ones we have in here, that are um, ener very er energy efficient. And it's actually gotten to the point where you almost can't go to the store and buy an incandescent bulb. Um, and yet the code is still acting like that's not the case. So did they discuss any of this? Are they looking, are we looking to see some changes where they'll just take away from some of these requirements that they ask us to have uh, on these, uh, on the drawings and documents because the market has, perf has done what these uh, codes have tried to do? I, um, I think we see eye to eye on this. Uh, the, I, I don't think that the code uh, keeps up with the pace of technology you know, with regard to lighting and control systems and so forth. Mm -hmm. and frankly, the software doesn't keep up with it either. So this is kind of, this is constant. The software, you mean? The software, the, the energy software. Uh -huh. um, there was a significant delay in the last go around with the software, and I, I can't remember specifically, but um, I, I, I do feel that the, the Energy Commission is constantly chasing after, you know, the, the technology that becomes available and such, mm -hmm. and um, how that affects the numerous forms that people are required to submit. I, I, I can't really comment on that. I, I will mention, though, and I believe I shared this with you, is the, um, the uh, uh, California Building Official Group has written a letter to the Energy Commission encouraging them to perhaps streamline the... Um, similar to how I'm required to streamline permits for mm -hmm. uh, electric vehicle and solar to consider streamlining the amount of paperwork that is required for various performance systems in, in the built environment. It'd be nice if they were adept or, or paying attention to what the market's doing when they, yeah. you know, update these things. The, the, uh, the other question I had is, and I've asked you this before, and uh, I, th I think it was so new you didn't have any idea, but they, they talk about this zero net energy goal. Do they have any idea of how that's going, going to be achieved? Well, uh, the zero net energy goal is that a, a home produces the amount of energy that, it's, that it uses. That's kind of the, the layman term for it. And you're going to see perhaps mandatory, perhaps mandatory solar, perhaps mandatory wind. Um, generated energy. I'm not sure how that'll look throughout the, the city. Yeah. Um, geothermal, um, increased efficiency on um, just the built environment, the, the envelope of the building itself. Um, appliances will fall into play with that. And that, that's one reason I mentioned um, uh, the, uh, the Energy Commission will be, it'll be a fairly steady march between now and the next three years or so with their um, increased um, standards to reach that goal by 2020. That's kind of an unknown right Is it right 2020 now. or 2030? It's 2020 for residential and 2030 for commercial. Zero net energy. Correct, yes. Wow. That's yeah, only not, four years away. <laughs> that's actually three years away. <laughs> for, for residential. Yes, for now, that's residential. new residential. It's, it's, yeah, it, it's new residential. Um, the residential reconstruction could, projects could fall under that as well, um, conceivably. Remodels? Not necessarily remodels. Necessarily. No, that's, that, it's really be interesting reaching. because, you know, on the one hand, they're not following the technology and what it's doing. And on the other, I, I'm sorry, this is important stuff and it's not it's funny. to you. It's important to you because no, no, you're no. in the business. No, no, no. I, some of these I'm, questions because happen. I'm in the business, I know it has it's nothing to do with this. It's I important to to everyone, and it's important to. We just talked about affordable housing. 
good luck doing affordable housing when you have to create housing that's zero net energy. And yet the technology, we are far away from technology that you could build a residential multifamily uh, complex and provide and put enough solar panels on the roof or anything to, to have it be zero net energy. And we haven't even talked about gas. <laughs> so what we're talking about is solar energy to heat the home, power the home, uh, do everything you want with the home, zero net energy. We're three years away and the technology is, is we're not anywhere close to that technology. And the thing I fear Mr. Grisilli, is that what the state is going to do is they're going to say, fine, you produce it to this amount and the rest will cover, will we'll, we'll put fees on you until you produce it. And, and I fear that day. I, I see that coming down the line. And the reason I'm asking these questions and having this discussion is because this is our guy who communicates back to these boards to some degree, I would suppose, and goes to the meetings and so forth when he can. So. It's on the dais. This is the time to have the discussion. Yes, I'm in the business, but you know I don't mention this any more for, for any more reason than you mentioned your aunt going to the bank. So, fair enough. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, let's move on. Ron, you had a question. Well, I had a lot of questions, but Bob said I couldn't ask him, so I, I'm cutting him in half. Uh, Actually, my only question is the 65% demolition debris diversion requirement, what does that mean? That if you don't demolish a house, you have to use 65% of what you, of the rubble? 65% has to be diverted. Uh, our current ordinance is actually at 60, uh, which is 10% above, no, I'm sorry, 5% above current Cal Green. So Cal Green jumped up to 65, which now is more restrictive than our current ordinance. It just means that more stuff needs to be diverted and not um, it really, it really, frankly, not, it, it, the 65% is, it's all good and fine. A lot of the projects that we issue permits for, I see a lot of people using Zanker and all these other uh, recycling facilities. It, this isn't a, a strange science anymore. There's, there's, there's lots of facilities out there that accommodate the uh, recycling needs, and I see a lot of it vol voluntary. Regardless, we, you there, there aren't truckloads going up to Ox Mountain anymore. It's that was, it's going to places that recycle it. In fact, if you see a lot of the larger projects, you'll see different piles of metal and concrete, and you know all that. Thank you, and and in the interest of uh, avoiding the wrath of Bob, I will cease my questioning. <laughs> Wise man. All right. Thanks, Ron. Ron, uh, Mark, you had another question? Uh, yeah, yes, I did. Um, and, you know, I'm going to risk the rest, wrath of Bob, whatever the heck that is. Um, no, seriously, uh, just a quick question, Chris. The, the, the zero net energy provision, is it on a energy type by energy type basis? In other words, you have to be zero net energy on electricity and gas separately, or is it just, hey, whatever the total amount of energy being used by the house has to be zero? There, there's still a lot of unknowns with the zero net energy goal. Um, I, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's probably my my guess or my theory is that it's a cumulative um, usage. Okay. So Which to speak. would certainly, uh, uh, I, I mean, I think Matt raises some interesting questions and some good ones. I've kind of wondered about how that, that's going to work out too. Yeah. Um, but then it would be certainly easier to do if you lump everything together. In the interest of providing feedback that you might offer to them if they haven't thought of this already, it occurs to me that depending upon what the state was trying to precisely accomplish with the zero net energy goal on new construction, perhaps arrangements that allow uh, property owners to commit to using the, one of the things we're going to talk about later tonight for the city, peninsula clean energy, as a way of satisfying that obligation. That might be a way of doing it that would be more amenable. It would be a contractual thing that basically you'd say it would go along with the property. I'm going to contract to buy power through you know, clean energy renewable here for my, my home. Yeah, that probably, I mean, in my, I, I, I see your point. I think that that will probably be part of the equation, you know, three years down the road. Feel free to suggest it. You don't even have to give me credit. Okay, okay thank you, Mark. Uh, 
Is there anyone wishing to speak on public comment on this item? I have no speaker cards. Hearing none, I will entertain a motion. Well, Mr. Mayor, I move to introduce uh, ordinance number 1512. 1512, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending San Carlos Municipal Code section 15.04. 110-California Fire Code dash to adopt the 2015 edition of the International Fire Code with the 2016 California Fire Code amendments, including all adopted standards as specified prescribing regulations governing conditions hazardous to life and property from fire, comma, hazardous materials or explosion and for providing the fire safety inspection process for hazardous <coughs> uses or operations and establishing a Bureau of Fire Prevention San Carlos Fire Ordinance. Second. Oh, and we have two two ordinances, both at once or separately. We should do them separately because okay. they're separately numbered. All right, I have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on on this? Hearing none, Crystal, please call the roll. Councilmember Collins. Yes. Councilmember Grassley. Yes. Councilmember Grocott. Yes. Councilmember Obert. Yes. Mayor Johnson. Yes. I believe we have a second motion. Oh, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll. Use my breath again here. Move to introduce ordinance number 1513. 1513, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of San Carlos amending San Carlos Municipal Code Chapter 15.04, Technical Building Codes, to adopt the 2016 editions of the California Administrative Code, California Building Code, Volumes 1 and 2, California Residential Code, California Electrical Code, California Mechanical Code, California Plumbing Code, California Energy Code, California Historical Code, California Existing Building Code, California Green Building Standards Code, comma, California Reference Standards Code. 1997 Uniform Security Code, the 2012 edition of the International Property Maintenance Code, with amendments and modifications and safety assessment programs, SAP, placards. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah, Bob can help me write my general notes now because he's so good at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a run on sentence, too. Any further discussion? <laughs> Crystal, please call the roll. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grassilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. And Mayor Johnson? Yes. All right, we'll move on to item 10B, consideration of adopting a resolution selecting Peninsula Clean Energy's Eco 100 product for the city's municipal operations and appropriating $27,000 to cover the cost for fiscal years 2016 through 2018. Ms. Peterson. Good evening. Good evening, Council. My name is Tara Peterson, Assistant City Manager. Good. Just wanted to make sure I could do this. So before you this evening is Peninsula Clean Energy Municipal Account Plan Options. It was briefly discussed at the last council meeting where we were talking about the Climate Action Plan, but tonight we go into a little more detail and ask for some council action. So a little bit of background, Peninsula Clean Energy was approved by all 20 cities and the county as the electricity provider for our community and our municipal operations. Um, they're rolling out service in two phases. Uh, October 1st was the first phase, which included all of the municipalities within the county. And the rest of the county, all the businesses as well as residents, will be phased in by April of 2017. Cities were required to select a plan option when we initially signed up uh, for service, and San Carlos selected the Eco Plus plan, which was the most popular plan as the default for the entire city, including the municipality. I'll go into details about the plans in a moment. Uh, PCE board asked for cities to take another look at um, considering the Eco 100 product uh, because it will show leadership in putting some money into going green and as well as, excuse me, um, it's more effective in reaching our greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions reductions that are in our climate action plan. So these are the two plans that uh, Peninsula Clean Energy offers. Um, Eco Plus, which is the default and the one we are currently in, and that offers 50% of the electricity from renewable resources, 75% which is greenhouse gas or GHG free. The generation rates are set at 5% below PG&E rates. So this is a cheaper option. The more deeper green option is the Eco 100, where 100% of the electricity is from renewable resources, 100% is GHG free, 
The generation rates are set at one cent kilowatt hour above the Eco Plus plan, and the rates are roughly 3% higher than PG&E. What does this mean to the city? So these are municipal counts uh, based on the annual cost for generation only. So as of up until September 30th, we were paying PG&E about 235,000 a year for energy. With the new Eco Plus program, that's been lowered to 223,000. So that's a difference of just under $12,000. The Eco 100 is higher than that. It would go up to 247 and it'd be about almost $13,000 more a year. Opting, opting up to Eco 100 would cost the city $25,000 more a year than the current Eco Plus program. And these numbers are slightly different than what was provided in the staff report because these numbers were updated by PCE just on Friday, but they reflect a better uh, cost for the city. There are eight cities that have opted to go to the Eco 100 plan for their municipalities. They're listed here. Um, cities that have not already opted up are either considering it or have decided not to do so based on the cost. So what we're asking for you tonight is to consider staying with Eco Plus, which would cost the city nothing, it would actually be less than what's budgeted for pg e or to opt up to the PC Eco 100 program, which is slightly more expensive, but has the benefit of more GHG reductions and the positive leadership. With that, I leave it to questions or comments. Questions for staff, uh, Ron? Uh, thanks, Cameron. Uh, thank you, Tara. Uh, so the question is, if we, uh, opt for the Eco Plus, which is the, the one that uh, saves us money. Right. Uh, are we, how long are we committed to that? Is it an annual election? You can opt out at any time. The council could make the decision to opt out of PCE and go back to PG&E at any time. And what if we wanted to change and go to the Eco 100? Again, you could do that at any time. At any time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Bob? Uh, thank you. Um, I see where, you're, where you said it's 5% less than PG&E, and that's about 11,578. In other words, 5% of the 235,000. Okay, I see that. But if you take 3%, you said it's three, the, the, Eco, the Eco 100 is 3% higher than PG&E, you said. Can I, can I take that one? Sure. So the way it works is that... Numbers aren't, I'm not questioning the concept. No, no, no. I'm just yeah, questioning no, the numbers. Just, it's, it's, not, it's not clear in the presentation. So. Your PG, your, um, your PG&E bill today has a generation component and a transmission component. With Peninsula Clean Energy, uh, PG&E is still your transmission provider. So you're still paying the transmission component. The component that it, um, PCE is ta taking over is the generation component. So it's not clear here, but when they talk about 5% below PG&E, they're saying 5% below PG&E generation rates, which is only a component of your bill. Okay. And when you're saying 3% higher than PG&E, you're saying 3% higher on the generation side. Okay. So it's not the whole component. So okay. think of it as roughly half. Okay. It still doesn't... Okay, I get that. But she used... In this proposal, in the staff report, she's got 5% of the number, which is correct. 3% of the number is $7,000. So that's where I'm confused. How come it's 27? And I, you explained it, but it's not explained in the staff report. So which one is, is it the way Stan, uh, he's explaining it? Well, yes, he's absolutely right. And as I indicated, the staff report was slightly off on the numbers. I, I discussed that with PCE on Friday, and we changed the numbers slightly. OK. And, and, I'm confused. It says 12,000, but we want 25, uh, and whatever. Okay. All right. Uh, any other comments or questions for staff? Is there any public wishing to uh, speak on this item? Uh, if not, I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I will move to introduce or adopt resolution 2016 96. 96, a resolution of the City Council of City of San Carlos selecting Peninsula Clean Energy's Eco 100 product 
for the city's municipal operations and appropriating 27,000 to cover the cost for fiscal years 2017, 16, 17, and 2017, 2018. I will second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Just a comment, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mark. I, I just want to mention in passing that if I remember the uh, uh, input we got from staff uh, a few months ago, I support doing this, um, but this also represents about roughly half the cost of what it would take to uh, share the costs of repairing sidewalks with the residents in San Carlos on an annual basis, and I suspect many of them would probably find doing something like that uh, at least as interesting and as uh, supportive of the community as what we're about to do here. But I do support this. All right. Thank you, Mark. Other discussion? Uh, I do. Yep. Um, right. I, I know I made the measure, or, or made the motion, rather, <laughs> for the, the resolution, but uh, uh, given our budget, um, I'm actually in favor more of the Eco Plus solution. So um, if, if this is going to remain as it is, I'm, I'm going to vote against it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I made the motion. But, uh, in the interest of moving time along so Bob doesn't okay. fall. So. Other, other discussion? You're voting against your own motion, and it's not even, you're not even, a, not no even doing a drill. No one else step forward to okay. make it in the interest of time. I made the motion. There, there is precedent for it. Yes, that's true. Uh, all right. Well, I will just say, you know, I, I hope my colleagues will support the motion. Uh, and I do support Ron's motion. Um, you know, we've put a lot of money into consultants, drafting climate action plans, um, looking for innovative solutions to reduce um, our greenhouse gas emissions in the city of San Carlos. We hold workshops, we, you know, try and educate the public. A lot of these things are very expensive uh, and they have, you know, small effects on the margin. They're important things to do as part of a larger overall effort. But if you wanted to put your money as efficiently as possible to reduce greenhouse gas emissions for the city facilities, there's nothing better that you could do than to simply buy it directly from the source. Think about what it would cost to spend money to hire consultants to figure out whether or not you could put solar panels on the roof. You do all sorts of things. With this, you know that all of the electricity consumed by the city government um, will be 100% greenhouse gas free. So I think at, from a pure cost efficiency perspective, there's a strong argument to be made that, hey, we're achieving what are already established goals for the city um, with this measure. The second thing, as Tara said, is this is a, it's a moment of leadership. You know, we believe that climate change poses a real threat, that we are trying to educate our citizens. We are trying to, ed to you know, reach out and encourage people to take steps in their own lives. Um, to you know, have a have a more energy efficient lifestyle. You know, to do all sorts of things. And what better way to say, hey, you know, in the city that you live in, the street lights. See that street light over there. You know, see those traffic signals. You know, those are powered with a hundred percent green power. I think it's a very powerful thing to say. So um, I understand, you know, concerns about potentially wanting um, uh, to save money, but I think. Given what we're already spending and given how much we're on the record as saying that this is one of our values that um, I think this is a smart thing to do. Um, just a just a brief comment. Yeah. I, I, I am, in, I, you know, conceptually I'm in favor of it. It's just that I, I favor a more incremental approach. Uh, quite frankly, I'd rather see how the other cities do. And and then maybe we change it next year. That's exactly why I asked the question of, of uh, Tara, can we change it at any time? Okay, thanks, Ron. Bob? Just to let you know, before you even spoke, uh, I was going to vote for this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thanks. You, you, we need to work out a signal here, Bob. Um, all right. Uh, any other comments? All right. Uh, Crystal, please call the roll. Councilmember Collins? No. Councilmember Grassilli? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? No. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Johnson? Yes. All right. Um, we'll now move on to item 10C. So it is my understanding that this data, or that this, that we are given the option to take up 10C under law, but that the staff recommendation is to not pass 10C. So I don't see uh, any compelling reason, unless one of my colleagues would li like to take it up and get a report and and have a motion. Uh, if we choose not to take it up, um, there's no, we're not, we're, we don't need to, right? This is just, this is an option given to the council. 
uh, staff is not recommending this option. So would anyone like to hear this item tonight? Um, if I may, um, I think echoing part of what, what you're saying, Mr. Mayor, um, I would like to see us discuss this at some point, perhaps in a more comprehensive thing. Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't mind taking a wait and see attitude on this and see what happens. Sure. Um, and, and see how things evolve. Okay, Matt? I suppose now's the time to throw this in. Um, for me, I, I had a discussion actually with the city manager about this today. And I could care less uh, if somebody wants to grow tomato plants or marijuana plants. It makes no difference. What does make a difference is secondhand smoke. Um, and I think once the, we get past the election and see how the voters of California go on this one, I think something that it would behoove us to take up is the issue of secondhand smoke because it seems to me we're treating uh, one product, tobacco, one way and another product, marijuana, a different way. Okay. Bob? Uh, I would just like to, I concur with the mayor and, and with staff. I think I'd like to see the electorate, what they're going to do in November, and then uh, have this discussion. Okay. Uh, Ron, did you have anything to add? Nope. Okay. So I don't hear any, uh, any call to bring this up, so I think we'll remove it from the agenda. Very good, and uh, if Prop 64 passes, there will actually be a whole number of things that yeah. need to come back to the council. So, Absolutely. All right, so that concludes our business for tonight, and we are adjourned. Thank you.